Good evening. Thank you for attending the September the 13th, 2021 meeting of the Westerville City Schools Board of Education. The agenda will be displayed on the screens in the front of the room. You may also follow along by connecting to the district's website at www.wcsoh.org. Click on our district link, then select Board of Education, and then Board Docs Agenda, and select this evening's meeting. There will be two opportunities to address the board this evening. The, the first being Agenda Item 6.01, the first set of public comments is relative to agenda items 7.01 through 11.03. Please state the agenda items you are referencing at the beginning of your comments. The second opportunity is agenda item 12.01. There is a sign-up sheet located on the table in the back of the room. Each speaker will have five minutes to address the board a timer will be shown on the screen. And with that, Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Altman? Here. Mrs. Davidson? Here. Mr. Villardo? Here. Dr. Nestor Baker? Here. Mr. Bell? Here. Agenda item 2.01, if you would please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Agenda item three, district highlights and recognitions. Um, we don't have any for this evening's agenda. Agenda item 4.01, approve the minutes of the Board of Education, <coughs> excuse me, regular meeting held on Monday, August 23rd, 2021, and the special meeting held on Monday, August 30th, 2021, as presented. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Any discussion, corrections, or additions? Hearing none, Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. That uh, motion carries. Moving on to agenda item five, which are reports. Agenda item 5.01. Name the school's status report that will be given by Dr. Ebrecht. Thank you. President Bell, Vice President Nestor Baker, members of the board, Dr. Kellogg, and Treasurer Marshall. I don't always get to come up and, and talk about something like so uplifting as name the schools because it's going to be around for decades to come. And I'll preface this by saying when we have children and we name them, we spend a lot of time thinking about that. We test it right? We, we see in what ways can it be rhymed or perhaps even misused. And so in regard to uh, name the schools, I'm going to I bring to you uh, the thoughts of our community. And uh, just as we cherish and are blessed by children, we're blessed by new schools. And that blessing will continue and we'll, we just will take a moment to think about what that name might be. And over the next couple of weeks, I'll give you an opportunity to reflect on that as a board. So as you are aware, Board, there is board policy around the uh, commemoration of school facilities and what that will look like and uh, very much parameters around that. You all had seen the, uh, you've been presented this with this information before, but I wanted the community to be aware that there is board policy around that. In addition, uh, naming conventions. In the past, our elementary schools, we've stuck with uh, literary figures, streets, communities, neighborhoods, and for middle schools, we tend to focus on townships and geographic features. So a timeline, what we're looking at is the new school will open up next school year, school year 22-23, and subsequently thereafter uh, in 23-24, our middle school. So over the past uh, number of days, we had a used thought exchange. I cannot tell you what a tremendous tool that is, because I can never think of a time, and I'll get, we're going to 
see th over 1,300 people participated. That's a lot of community members, a lot of people, and, and they, for the most part, all used the electronic thought exchange rather than sending something to me through snail mail. So that was encouraging too that we kind of moved over to that. So we've sent this out using social media, and so I'm giving you the report tonight. And uh, again, we want to come back here at our next board meeting and perhaps solidify what that is because as we move forward, we need to have that in place. Uh, one, we need to, to order the sign, right? And then uh, in October, I'm going to be having another thought exchange, and this is going to be just focused with our parents, uh, parents and children that will be attending those schools. They're going to have a chance uh, to, to pick the mascot and the school colors. And that is for them to do. Uh, the board is focused, from what I understand, uh, solely on name, the naming of the school. So I'm going to start with the middle school. <laughs> There's no question that of all the results, when you think of a slam dunk, a spike in a volleyball game, I mean, basically, Minerva Park Middle School was I don't, there were very few other options and in terms of ratings, because we had 28,241 ratings on this. And we had over 1,100 thoughts shared. T to encapsulate that and say it was Minerva Park Middle School is kind of an understatement, okay? Now, yes, you could maybe consider it Minerva Middle School, but there is a Minerva community, as you may wear, be aware, I can Canton, I believe, up that way, northeast. So, um, and because of like Walnut Springs, okay, um, you know, Minerva Park Middle School has a ring to it. And I also think, what would a secretary, every time a secretary answers the phone, you realize that whatever you come up with is going to be said millions of times, <laughs> you know, hundreds a day. So you got to think about that too. So that's what it came down to Minerva Park Middle School, but of course, it is up to you folks to figure out if that's what you want to go with uh, based on that input. But the other ones, uh, overwhelmingly, it was either Tony Morrison or Maya Angelo. Now, I have to tell you, I, I did a Google search three times because I just wanted to hear it over and over and over again because I've heard Angelou and I've heard Angelo. According to Google, if you Google it, it says Angelo. Okay? So I've heard it pronounced either way, but according to Google, it's Angelo. And so by far, Morrison Elementary, Angelo Elementary is what kind of came to the surface, okay? But at the same time, there were, there were individuals that felt Phyllis Wheatley, Langston Hughes, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, were viable options for us. And as you can see, there were two Ohio-born individuals, if that's what we're wanting to kind of hone in on a little bit, of something, because you look at all the variables, um, Tony Morrison and, and Paul Dunbar. So, but of course, wonderful, they, and, and, and the community stuck with the thought to continue with the literary figures, as you can see there, um, for the naming of the elementary. So there's a lot to think about. How would, how would it come off in terms of uh, how it's said repeatedly, you know, is the pronunciation? Um, that is all for you folks to, to figure out, okay? So with that brief report, any comments, questions, thoughts? I like your um, comparison to naming a child. You know how we all, when we name our child, we pretend they're walking across the stage to get their diploma or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's very much like that because as you say, this will be the name of the school. This is how it will be known for decades, if not, well, for its entire history. Yes. That's how it will be known. Um, I was privileged to be on the board when we named Central and Faust and Alcott, and it is wonderful to see the community come together around the naming of these buildings, as it shows the importance of the buildings to the community overall. And just as we saw in our last naming of buildings, this time we're also seeing the names coming from across the entire district from people who live everywhere within our district and all different types of people, different ages of people, different professions of people, everybody in our district can participate. And I'm very pleased that we did it that way and I'm really tickled with the amount of people that we have had weigh in on this. Uh, and I really also am, I gotta admit, I'm already pleased about Minerva Park Middle 
because I grew up in Minerva Park, and it's pretty strong heritage down there around the amusement park and uh, the heritage of that particular neighborhood as a part of this particular school district. So I'm glad to see that is in uh, the top running at this point in time, but we'll see where everybody goes, you know, when the board comes around. Mm -hmm. The elementary school, I'm going to be saying the names over and over and over again as if I'm answering the phone, as if I'm typing it on a keyboard, as if I'm saying it, that this is where I go to school or this is where I work or whatever, and uh, see how that plays. But thank you for spearheading this. It's, mm -hmm. it's very exciting. It's been a pleasure and very fun. Other thoughts? Scott, quick question. I'm sorry to put you um, in the spotlight right now. We, do we have any other schools named after females? I was trying to go Al through. Uh, uh, yeah. Wilder. Yeah. Okay. Alcott and Wilder are our female buildings. Okay. We do. Just a quick reflection. Uh, those people, can you go back to the name slide? And, you know, I don't know everything about all of those. Uh, but those are some really meaningful people. Very well, they strong. have some significant, all, all five. Yes. Um, a, lot, and a lot of thought went into that because you could see based on the suggestions and, mm -hmm. and, and to your point, uh, Dr. Nestor Baker, I believe it was multi-generational input. Mm -hmm. I just want to um, just thanks to everybody who contributed their ideas as the history nerd up here. I'll just contribute that um, Toni Morrison grew up in Lorraine, was born in Lorraine, Ohio, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar's um, affiliated with Dayton. So just if anyone's wondering whether any of them have a central Ohio, no, but it's wonderful to have some Ohio-based suggestions here. So mm -hmm. thanks to everybody. And another history lesson, Faust was a central Ohio uh, person when we named it's. It's, yeah. I think, important for us to look at not only the naming conventions, how we do it, mm -hmm. but how those names play out across history and across geography. So the district has a great deal to be proud of with the names it's chosen over time and now. I like the idea that um, district-wide will have some naming, but location of families can claim colors and mascot and just like just like really ownership of that i think that's pretty cool and i'll clarify just to be sure everyone here is the same thing elementary colors and mascot and just the mascot at the middle school because all the middle schools have that uh, royal blue like a gray and a white yeah great yeah great so don't forget scott we've got three dogs and a cat i know at middle school remember that I forgot. I also was here when we named Genoa. Anyway, but yeah, when, just keep that in mind. Oh, we I have know. three dogs and a cat. We could have three dogs and two cats. <laughs> three dogs, yeah. a cat, and a squirrel. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fun, because, you know, you, at, like the, the cross-country meet, for example, is called three dogs and a cat. And, right. and the kids, they, that's it, right? Now they're going to have to add something else in there. So a lot to think about. Yeah, that's right. All right. So... I'll be back uh, next board meeting and we'll have some more conversations and keep on plugging away and, and move to the next level here soon with the mascots and colors, okay? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. E. Britt. Gotcha. Moving on to agenda item 5.02, the superintendent's report. Dr. Kellogg, would you please share with us this evening? Thank you. Jill's gonna run the PowerPoint from the back. Um, I don't have that technology expertise yet, so we'll let her do that for me. Uh, thank you, President Bell, members of the board, for this opportunity to uh, share with you a little bit this evening about Ford together. This is a uh, review of our strategic plan. You know, as we all know, over the last, I'll call it 18 months, 20 months, there's been a lot of disruptions to public education, uh, a lot on our minds about where our students are um, in terms of their education, their uh, mental health, their well-being, and where they're going to be in the future. And so um, while we're still in that phase of, of negotiating ourselves through this unprecedented time, we also know it's really important to keep our eye on the ball several years down the line so that we know what those kindergartens we have today will experience and, and what, what uh, capacity we will build in them and what aspirations will help them build for themselves between now and when they graduate. So we want to keep our eye on the prize in front of us as we move forward um, uh, from, from where we're at. So 
why, why a strategic plan, what's, it, what's its function, what is it really trying to do? And, and our strategic plan really starts with trying to align our plan with community aspirations. And you'll see some of that in some of the work I'm going to share with this evening. But really, public schools are a local, locally run local entity and should reflect the aspirations of the community members, all the community members that are part of that community. The state has a say in some of that. The feds have less of a say in some of that. It really is a function at its core of our constituency that lives here in our school district, that, as we've seen tonight with participation in naming of schools. So uh, we know we have an actively engaged community who are very interested in their public schools and their value of them. And um, we want to make sure that we align our asp their aspirations with what we're trying to do. The other piece is, you know, we're a big, complicated piece of machinery. You know, 14,800 students, you throw in your staff members in there almost 100,000 residents living in our community. We're a big, complicated um, organization, community of people, and um, trying to provide clarity and a shared vision around what we're trying to do together is really, really important. Um, and so that's part of what our strategic plan does. You know, and in our mission statement, we talk about, as you'll see, ever-changing world. And before we get too far into the strategic plan, I want to talk about the fast-changing world. So I want to share something with you that's really become, uh, for, for a guy like me who's on the other side of his career path, uh, a little bit of an insight of, of, of how the world's changed. So I've got a quick video. Joe, if we could flip slides. So I want you to keep in mind a mission statement about changing the world in which we kid, our li kids uh, live and listen to Heather McGowan talk. Uh, there's a couple snippets of video and presentation she's done here that talk a little bit about the changing workforce, the changing world, and the impact of technology on our kids. So Joe, if we could... Roll that video, that'd be great. I love it when it works. So to put some context on that, if you look at the largest companies by market cap, and many of them are US based, over the last 100 years, in 1917, four of the five companies were about extracting value from natural resources. 50 years later, the top five companies were about scalable production of man-made assets and services, man-made products and services. And if you look at where we are now, Top five companies, I would argue four, if not five of them, are all learning companies. It's, we're moving from what John Hagel from Deloitte says, from scalable production to scalable learning. So, so we're entering a new era in human history as well. Um, eras are marked by a time span, but also how we value talent and how we use tools as humans. So we started with the hunter-gatherer, with strength and speed, we used handles. Fast forward to where we are about now, um, we're in the information era, it's been about decades, every era is collapsing by a factor of 10. We value, ta value talent in the information era by acquiring knowledge and skill. It would learn to do something, be an expert in that thing. Uh, tools were caught in the reduction, you used the PC, you used Excel to do financial calculations, etc. So that reduced your, uh, expanded your ability to do work. We're now in the, moving into the augmented era. It's the exact opposite of the information era. Creativity, agility, adaptability, everything the robots can't do. And it's about cognitive augmentation. So M, uh, Watson can now read MRIs. So the doctor partners with Watson. Watson can now read legal research. The lawyer partners with Watson. So it is about, it's, it's the difference between learning to use a tool, like you had to learn to use Excel in order to use it, to learning from and with a tool. It's a shift. So in the old economy where you acquired expertise as you went up the escalator, problems were complicated. They broke down into subcomponents. So by the time you got to the top of the ladder, you had the experience of everybody underneath you. There's nothing to change that much. But now, instead of a complicated world, I think it looks more like this. We're in a complex world. And as a result, our decision making needs to look different if you've got people who've got all sorts of experiences at all levels in your organization, and all types of knowledge. So that gives you a quick insight into at least one person who spends their time looking at the, um, the, the, the cross-section of uh, technology tools, acceleration of, of um, changes in our society, and the impact on the world our kids are going to be walking into in the future. So you think about those kindergartners today who will in 13 years be seniors in high school, and you look at those time frames and you start to understand um, what we're preparing them for. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Jill. 
So here's another way to look at it that I think is really kind of fascinating. It takes a little bit of time to digest, so I'll, I'll walk through. So the top graph obviously is, is a, uh, a graph of the pace of change, velocity of change, right? And so as you move from left to right on the continuum of time on that bottom coordinate, you can see a series of well-known um, technology innovations that changed the way people worked or the way they, they engaged in life. And you see how those things start to accelerate from the steam engine back there in 1750 to um, the top end merging of cyber biological and physical systems that we're seeing today. The other thing you see, and so you have this rapid changing acceleration of change, new technologies, innovations coming into our lives that change the way we live and interact. Then the bottom, you see those lifespans, life expectancy, so that's the other thing. So in 1750, average lifespan was 37 years. You move to, to the 1950s, it's expanding to 69, and because of healthcare and the, the way human beings are, are engaging today, we see that that life expectancy continues to get longer and longer, which I'm appreciative of. So what you have is, within a, a single lifespan, multiple technologies that come into your life, and if you start to reflect on the years you've been alive, you can probably pinpoint some of these specific technologies that came in, right? and disrupted or changed the way we lived and the way we interact with each other through our lifetime. So life expectancy gets longer, the velocity of change of technology comes quicker, and what you have is you're experiencing a high degree of change in your lifetime more so than any other time before. That's what our children are walking into, and that's what we're experiencing, right? That's what we see. Um, and maybe for an old guy like me, it's harder to digest all that change and figure out what does it mean. And I think there's a lot of that going on uh, in our world. So it's not just the world is changing. It's the world is changing really fast for our kids. And we need a system in which prepares them differently. Um, uh, there was a quote um, by a gentleman who wrote, the world is flat. We said, no longer can you dine out for 35 years on your bachelor's degree from college for the next 35 years in your life. You're gonna have to change careers, change professions, change the work you do. You're gonna continue educating the entire time. So those two aren't separate from each other. They're joined at the hip. So we get a sense of that change. Next slide, please, Jill. So how did the components of our, of our plan come together? And I, I want to share again, it, it is intended to reflect community aspirations. And so you may recall that in 2013 and 2017, we went through a large community engagement practice where we asked broad stroke questions of a lot of community members about what kind of school district do you want? What kind of system do you want for our students and for our community overall? And those are still, the um, backbone of the entire plan, the larger plan that are in there. And I'll show you some examples of those. And we always have ongoing community engagement. So whereas 13 and 17 was a large, big picture, direction of the district, what kind of school district do you want? We're consistently, um, and I know this board in particular is um, very focused on this, engaging our community on more specific decision points, naming schools this evening, mascots. When we went through our facilities master planning before we went on the ballot, we did a lot of community engagement. We did that around boundary planning last year, and we did that with portrait or graduate. Those are examples of places that become components of our larger strategic plan and our efforts to move forward and get community engagement. So it is not a singular process. It is an ongoing process, both from a big picture to some of the smaller, more discrete components, and we'll always value that. So that's how we've built this thing. Uh, Jill, next slide, please. So what, what is in the, in, in the plan? And so I want to point to the little graphic you see there. That this is um, one of the four quotes on a sticky note on my computer that some have heard me reference before. This is, quote, we're using a compass, not a map. There's a big difference. With a compass, you know you're going from point A to point B. What you don't know is what's between point A and point B. When you use a map, you've got street names, lights, turns, everything you might need to know along the way. The path is clear, therefore you, you can see exactly what you can encounter and plan for it. That's not what we live in. We have a world in which we're negotiating where we're trying to get to from point A to point B. We know where we want to be. We know what we want from our students. We're just not sure what we're going to count along the way. Last 18 months would be a great example of what might happen when you're using a compass. So that requires some flexibility and always some forethought. So the, the what of our strategic plan is, you can really think about it as having six separate chapters. And those are our perf six performance objectives. These are really those big chunks of work that we focus on, the way our organizational chart works, the things that we, when you really boil it down, these are the major pieces of work. So obviously the main one is 
academic success. So our first performance objective is we want every student to achieve academic success. That's our, that's our bread and butter, right? Underneath that, it's the HR piece, the kind of people we hire, um, how we develop them, how we retain them, how we keep highly skilled, effective people in front of our, our students. This is everything from bus drivers, custodians, to teachers, to principals, everybody in the system. We want to make sure we have resources available to address the social emotional well-being of our students. That's an important one for us. And we've seen that, particularly even pre-COVID, starting to take a much more important role in the education of children. As I like to say, until we have their souls and their hearts, it's hard to get to their minds. And we know that's the case right now. They're feeling pressure and stress. They always do. They're feeling it more so now. And so making sure we have resources there, and this board's done a great job of pushing that and allowing for that in our system. We have a great team there. Um, learning and work environments. These physical environments where our students are coming to school, where our staff are working, we want them to be safe, we want them to be nurturing, we want them to be efficient, and, and we want them to be inspiring. And as you look at some of the building projects going on and you look at those pictures, we'll see more, I think, in our next board meeting. Um, you'll get to see some updated pictures in some of our building projects. Even this facility, when you walk in, you see components that are intended to be not just safe and efficient, but inspiring in some way. And so, Building that in. Kids do respond to the environment around them. They do read those cues and they will tell you it's a signal to them about how the system and the adults in the community feel about them. They feel valued when they have those, those great spaces. And we've invested a lot, the community's invested a lot in that first as well. We want our communities and, and, and community members and parents and students and staff to be engaged as partners. Um, we're gonna um, continue that practice. Uh, you know, I always remind myself um, when we're engaging with partners, when we're talking to community members, parents, oftentimes the end game is the same. We all have the same aspirations for children. We want them to be successful. We want them to be well-trained. What we tend to disagree on is some of the components of what that, what that looks like, right? Um, and I think that's an important piece to remember. We need to keep that engagement. And the last thing, of course, is, is the financial resources. We want those aligned to supporting student success, the things that are important to us. Ms. Marshall and her team do an outstanding job there. This is um, not just about financial resources, it's also about capitalizing on the resources we have and using them to the best of our ability, directing them to where they need to be, um, sometimes having to let some sacred cows go in order to, to make room for what needs to happen. And we've made those adjustments along the way in our organizational chart and some of our priorities. But we need to continue that piece so that the vast financial resources our community gives to us is being spent in a way and used in a way that benefits students primarily. And so, um, we we, uh, we want to keep an eye on that. So, th so think about this as having six chapters, those six chapters, okay? Uh, next slide, Jill. So in each chapter, there's a couple of sections in the larger document um, uh, for you. Um, each of them has these four components. So as I said, key themes from the community. So you'll see in each chapter, under each one of those performance objectives, the themes that came out of the 13 and 17 engagement with the public about what are your aspirations? What kind of public school do you want? And this is an example of one of them. I think it's a great example as we start to look at our Port River graduate work we're talking about um, in the next couple months. It was student mastery of content knowledge is important, but students also need to develop social interaction and real world skills. And I think that echoes what you saw in some of those videos about the world kids are going into. It's not just about having knowledge, it's being able to do something with that knowledge. Uh, and not even just applying it to, I know how to run a spreadsheet, but listen to what she said about how now the doctor works alongside, augmented with technology as a partner in making decisions. And so that's an example of some of the themes you see from the community in that document that we're trying to reflect in our work. The, each of the chapters has some baseline data. So example, under the, every student's academic success, what are some of the measurement points we use that to make sure we're, we're taking temperature probes and making sure that the system's operating the way we want? What are those key metrics we would use? An obvious one, of course, is your four-year graduation rate. That's the end game. That's, that's where we're trying to get to, right? 100% graduation on time and with the skills they need is really the ultimate goal. So that's one of the metrics in our baseline indicators. It also identifies key targets. What do we need to get better at moving forward in order to move the system? And so, for example, one of the strategic strategies we're looking at that we think aligns with that uh, key themes from the community that we think will add value to our graduates is this profile of a graduate that we're starting to unroll and, and work with our in-house and with our community about what does that mean? Um, and you'll, you'll get some of that in the coming meetings. 
And then what do we leverage? What do we have at our, what tools do we have at our hands already that we can use as leverages to move these things forward, right? A lot of that is policy and strategy um, and people, human resources that we have. So for example, within our academic program, the curriculum and materials adoption process, uh, which is associated with board policies, is a major driver, right? So if we wanna talk about diversifying the literature that we have for students, that process is the leverage by which we want to do that. If we want to uh, adjust our curriculum because we're not getting the outcomes we want, that's the leverage by which we do that. The board has a policy, we have a system in place um, that we can, we can leverage in order to bring that forward moving forward. So we don't have to reinvent things, we gotta capitalize on what we have um, to, to make the movement we want. So every one of those six chapters has those components. Next slide, Jill. So this goes back to the ever-changing world and the unpredictable. The, 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 the plan is defined, but it has to be adaptable. And as I always say, every good plan should be written in pencil. You never know what's gonna come, what's gonna change. So it needs constant review and revision. There are other forces that might affect the direction we're going that can be available resources. We talk a lot about state funding, new funding formulas. Um, local economic conditions can affect that. Economic downturns, economic upturns on a local level. The bulk of our money comes from local property taxes, so any economic conditions that affect that, uh, Ms. Marshall plugs that into our forecast and we understand what the resources we have available to us, and they do change. There can be changes in regulations and laws that impact us at the federal level, the state level, local level that have to be put into place. And then data and outcomes. If, if we're Working on something we think is uh, the right strategy, but we're not getting the right results, then there's either something wrong with our implementation or we gotta get to a different strategy. And so using data and looking at our outcomes becomes an important part of the whole process. That's gonna prioritize because we don't have an endless bank account. It's not fair to continue going back to the community to ask for more and more money. So we really need to look at, are we getting the return on investment we wanted? We're we getting the actual outcomes we want? And where can we increase and improve efficiencies um, so that we make sure we're utilizing the resources towards the outcomes we want, right? So those are our important questions. Before we ask for more, we always gotta scour to see how can we capitalize on what we have or what could be tweaked or moved in order to, to, to achieve the goal we want. Prioritization is important. So we're still building off of the long-standing vision and mission statement we have, benchmark of educational excellence, and our mission to prepare students to contribute to the competitive and changing world in which we live. Those will remain um, our core pieces. Next slide, Jill. So the interesting thing about strategic plans is they're these lengthy, page-long documents with lots of words, and they take a lot of patience and, um, and effort to read, and then they can easily be set aside. We wanted to distill ours down to some simple po components that were uh, both um, digestible and easy to represent for our community, and that's the game plan going forward. So these statements really align with those, those six chapters, some of them more than one per chapter, um, about what are we trying to do? So what does four together mean? Four together, we will design each student's learning experience through the lens of a portrait of a graduate to ensure they receive necessary support for their academic and personal growth. Well, what does that look like in our district? I point to a couple examples of places that I see now that represent what we're looking for when we do portrait of a graduate. Um, one would be our Global Scholars Program through Columbus Council for World Affairs. And the experience those 11th to 12th graders have through that coursework, interacting with people in the community um, and, and having a final project. I would say our students who attend the Career Tech Center, Delaware and Columbus City Schools, probably have an experience that's more closely aligned to our portrait of a graduate with practical skills coming out, workplace skills coming out. Um, a lot of them with certificates and licenses that move them right to work. There's a great story in Westville Magazine I think last month about one of our graduates um, who was in our health pathways who's got her uh, certificate and she's working in a pharmacy at the same time she's going to school. It's a great story. It's an outgrowth of her engaging in our health pathways. That's the kind of experience we want to have. Um, talks about more equitable school district where everyone feels, feels value. We want to take these components, um, continue to uh, emphasize them both uh, to our internal stakeholders, for our teachers and staff, and for a community, <coughs> couple of those with communication pieces, examples of, this is what this looks like now, or this is where we're trying to go. So we kind of have small chunks of digestible, understandable components of the strategic plan periodically being pushed out to a community 
for helping understanding and keeping in front of us, <coughs> rather than having a, a, a voluminous document in a binder sitting on a shelf that we dust off every now and then. So uh, that's our vision for this. So obviously the larger plan has a lot more words and a lot more components to we'll make that available uh, for the board and the public. But I wanted to give you a brief overview. And uh, as I shared, um, I have, uh, next slide please, Joe. I do have our key <coughs> leaders here this evening that um, operate around those pillars that are available. If you have specific questions for them or me, like, you, like some more clarification or them to project what does that mean for them in the coming years or in near, near, near term, happy to answer any questions the board might have. Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab a little bit. Um, this first uh, phase is going to be for uh, Ms. Marshall, Treasurer, uh, CFO. Um, on, oh, the slides are gone. Um, on one of the slides, <laughs> it said to help develop a more, maybe back one, Jill? Yeah, thanks. I'm sorry, I should have. I should have said that. Uh, and, uh, yes. Third down, left side, strive to create a more equitable school community where all stakeholders feel valued. I um, serve with you on the district equity team in the uh, subgroup funding along with Dr. Kellogg. And one of the things we talk about is how to fund our building equity teams so that those are funded in an equitable manner responding to the needs of the school and not just distributing money. So what I think would be helpful is how are we going about doing that? What is the process for helping to create an equitable distribution of those funds to be used in the schools? Great question. Um, so uh, we did work with the district equity team over this past year looking at our budget process. So the district has a very expansive budget process where we meet with all of our building principals, department leaders, and um, things like that during the year to go over what are the needs in their buildings and their departments, um, what are the resources we have available, and how can we set the budget for the upcoming year to align with their goals that they have in place. Uh, and as the, we went through the process with the district equity team um, and creating the building equity teams, we noticed that there was a gap there and that our building equity teams were creating goals but didn't necessarily have funds available to help reach those goals in the future. So we put together a process where we looked at um, a per pupil allocation based on students in each building for our, um, different, building different buildings. And it takes into account the economically disadvantaged students and also the non-white students. And it provides an additional allocation specifically uh, targeted for the, dis the building equity teams to use in their, um, like, to, to work towards their goals. So, and I know um, just in conversations with our different building leaders, they seem to be uh, very happy with where we landed with that this year. And so we're continuing to look at that moving forward. If there's more we need to add or um, changes we need to make, we continue to review that. And I, I appreciate that explanation. I, you know, as I said, I work with you in that, but, but I don't know that the community would know that the, the building teams themselves, the boots on the grounds themselves, help to define what is the need in our school, and here is where we can, district-wide, we can use your support. That's a very, it's a very helpful tool, and I've heard from a number of schools that they have um, been fortunate enough to, to really develop some programs that have been helpful to their students, like on the ground, doing that work. Um, just a note, thanks, Nicole. Um, this is Scott Reeves, Scott Reeves here. Scott, could you come forward? I wanna, I wanna ask you a question because um, uh, bullet two, or kind of phrase two up there, left side, 
hire, develop, retain highly skilled teachers, staff administrators, dedicated education, committed to continued professional growth um, in the world of HR. Mm -hmm. And on the six performance objectives, one of the things it says, if, Nicole, if uh, uh, Jill, you could go back like two or three, I believe. One more, I think I got it. So these objectives, and Scott, the one I'm, I'm looking at uh, for this question is two, of course, student learning driven by recruiting, developing, retaining, highly skilled. Here's, here's the question that I will get sometimes from community members. Mm -hmm. We say that we want to diversify our staff. And th that is a value because our student body is diverse only makes sense. Um, two part, mm -hmm. how are you uh, trying to diversify our staff? Just what are some of those steps that people may not know in the HR world, this is what we do in the schools to try and to, to, to get uh, highly trained, highly effective, et cetera, diversity of staff. And the second question really is it's, part, it's, a, it's a B, why is it as hard as it seems to be? What are the obstacles? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Bellardo. And I, I'll work on uh, answering the second, uh, the B side of your 45. Uh, those of us that are old enough to oh, have a 45. Oh, I see what you did there. Uh, the B side <laughs> sometimes had the better song. <laughs> um, <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, if the board remembers, I sent you guys a link to, from an article from the Columbus Dispatch, uh, the August 22nd Columbus Dispatch, entitled A Learning Curve on Diversity. And there were some very ominous numbers in there that the dozens and dozens and dozens of school districts around our state are dealing with as, as we are all trying to uh, hire and retain high quality teachers that reflect the student bodies that we have. Um, in our state, 95% of our teachers uh, in our state are white. And one of the things that our department is working on right now is a very comprehensive school profile of the staffing of all of our buildings. And, and uh, when we finish that, I'll share the, uh, the outcomes of that with our board. But when you look at our school district, our school district in many ways reflects the statewide uh, reflection of the, the diversity of, of our staff. And about a third of the buildings in the state of Ohio, at least a third of the buildings, are 100% white staffed. And we have several of our buildings in our district that are 100% white staffed. And so we know that our kids don't look that way. One of the problems that we are facing, and, and it was outlined in that article from the Dean of Education from the University of Miami, Ohio, and Bowling Green and Central State University, is that the number of candidates of non-white students in our colleges of education are, are just plummeting. Uh, a couple of numbers to look at, in 2010, the number of students in all of our colleges and universities in, their in the colleges of ed in our state was 3,645. Just eight years later, in 2018, that number dropped to 1,189. Wow. That's a 67% drop um, in, in just candidates. And in, you know, from my perspective, having grown up in an urban district in Columbus and having taught nine years in Columbus, it, it seems that the lion's share of non-white teachers are in those urban districts in Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton and Cincinnati and in, in, in Toledo and Youngstown and places like that. And so when you have rapidly diversifying suburbs like ours and Worthington and Gahanna and Pickerington, um, we are all fighting for really relatively small, small amount of, of candidates. A, shri a shrinking. A, a shrinking, shrinking amount of candidates. So some of the things that ha have uh, different colleges, even the, the state of Ohio, uh, the Ohio Department of Ed is doing. Um, I know that in 2018, the Ohio Department of Ed developed a task force that combined uh, committee members from higher ed and committee members from K-12, and if that task force is still ongoing, I hope to find my way on it some kind of way, um, that are looking to find solutions. And so some of the partnerships that we have started to enter in with, and actually uh, this partnership was started with Dr. Hopkins, uh, then just kind of was on the freeze like everything when COVID hit that um, I've been engaged with, with some of these folks to restart is a grow your own 
um, concept with Otterbein, and, and, and here's some of the, the, the partnership things that we can do with Otterbein. Number one, if, if, if any of our students are involved in any one of these different programs, whether it is Otterbein has a College Credit Plus course called Education 1000, and <clears throat> we're really just to the point of starting to market it. So now you're kind of looking in a lag a year or two years out. Uh, last year we had two kids take that course. This year we have one kid in that course. We have um, uh, some of our students in both Delaware Area Career Center and Columbus City Schools who have education programs and early learning programs, and we have uh, a few number of students in those programs. Uh, we also have um, uh, looking at developing a teacher academy, and actually um, I'm meeting next week with uh, the professor at Otterbein that started that concept with Dr. Hopkins. She now works in uh, Olentangy. And she and I are meeting next week to talk about uh, ways to develop a teacher academy. And I've already had conversations with Rhonda Gilpin about partnering together with WEA to grow our students and to get them interested in uh, education. And as well, Cynthia and I have had conversations um, and through the district equity team of uh, there's a, an educator rising. Uh, it's a club kids can belong in. It used to be called Future Teachers of America. But there are ways that we can target because nationally you find teachers come back to very close to where they grew up. And you see that within our district uh, that there are a ton of Westerville students and uh, former Westerville students. And, and you remember, I think you were part of this group. Uh, several of us visited one of our uh, social justice classes at Westerville Central and uh, a class full of our, our black students giving very eloquent um, reports on things that they've studied and we did a Q&A with them and one of the questions I think Dr. Kellogg if you remember you asked them or the students asked why can't we get more teachers that look like us and Dr. Kellogg you know talked about some of the very same things that I just shared and then he says well let me ask you guys <clears throat> how many of you want to be teachers and Dr. Kellogg, how many hands went up? Zero. Zero. And so, you know, the, the difficult thing is for some of our students is they don't see themselves as teachers because they don't see teachers around them that look like them. And so they'll say, well, this profession isn't for me. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, Pastor Bell and I, we've had conversations of, of, of talking to these children and saying whether you're some of our black students, our Latino students, our Somali students, our Bhutanese Nepali, you know, want, go and come back and be the person you needed. Be that person for the kid coming up that you most needed. And, and we know why. The, the, the research is very clear. The impact on uh, students of color to have a teacher of color on their social connection, on their academic performance. Um, and, and I think their aspirations, and I use myself as an example, when I was in high school and I went to Eastmore High School uh, here in Columbus, and my principal was black, our assistant principal was black, um, Bob Stamps and Frederica Miller, my school counselor was black, Ed Smith, my basketball coach Ed Johnson was black, and my favorite teacher Janice Alsop was black. And what that did was it built relationships, positive relationships with me and my teachers that I could see myself in that role. Um, but it also made it not unusual or unattainable for a black man or woman to be in a position of leadership because we saw it every day. It's also important, uh, equally, research will suggest that uh, it is important for white students to be in front of a teacher of color and white colleagues to have teachers of color with them. And I'll, I'll share this and long-winded to your, uh, but you love that though. Um, <clears throat> my mom is from Urbana, Ohio, a little country town yeah. in, in yeah. west central Ohio. Um, she came to Columbus and, and her and my father were married in 1963. Her younger brother in the mid-1960s after he graduated from Urbana came to live with them for a while. Well, he met and married my Aunt Rosalie who went to Columbus East High School, lived on and around Mount Vernon and Long Street, and could probably go a week or two without ever interacting with a white person. And he takes her back to Urbana. Well, she was a teacher, and she taught in West Liberty, Ohio. And if you don't know where West Liberty is, it's about a 10 street village. It's not even big enough to be a town, about halfway between Urbana and uh, Bell Fountain. And I think it's safe to say in the late 1960s, early 1970s, maybe even today, she was maybe the only black 
face in the space. And the biggest uh, problem, issue that the school board and the principals had when, they, when she was hired were parents who were angry because they did not want their children in her class. She stayed there the entire time of her teaching career. And the biggest problem that the school board and the principals had by the time she left was dealing with angry parents who could not get their kids into her class. And even now, she gets emails, letters, people reach out to her on Facebook, uh, a lot of rural farm, you know, country guys and gals who say, you've had such an impact on my life. And with what our country is going through, I know that my relationship with you has made me more open and accepting than maybe I wouldn't have been, and I thank you for that. So, you know, that shows the impact that it has on, on everyone. And so that's important for us, and we are going to be very intentional about creating partnerships with our colleges and universities, not only in Ohio, uh, but trying to convince maybe a kid to leave sunny Tampa, Florida, uh, and come be a teacher here in Westerville and, and, <laughs> and, and create those relationships with uh, not only our majority white universities, but a lot of our uh, HBCUs. We, we have a couple in Ohio, Central State, and Wilberforce, um, but you know we've got Kentucky State nearby and Tennessee State that's not that far away, Chicago. So you know there there are places that we can reach out to that are in reason to say, hey, this is a great place to be. We've been working with uh, Charlie to to develop what we hope is going to be a spectacular recruiting video of why you want to be here. Why not only is it a great school district, but it's a great community and a great area to be. So I just really appreciate that answer scott on 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 many levels um because i i not speaking for the board uh, but i will be a board member who will insist that we continue to try and diversify our our, our teaching core our staff core to reflect who we have in the community uh, of our schools um, I went to Cincinnati Public Schools, um, and uh, I don't know if we played you in football or something, but we probably would have beaten you. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I had more um, African American teachers than I had white, mm -hmm. and many more uh, friends of color at that school. And I really wanted to emphasize the last piece of you saying it makes a difference for every student because that really is the world and I just wanted people to hear that we're not just saying we're trying to develop this but we have some boots on the ground and we're trying to um, figure out ways to develop resources where the pool of resources act is actually shrinking right now. And, and, and we can be one of the places to turn that around. Thanks, Scott. Sure. I'm, I'm not gonna add, I'm not gonna get this whole time, but it's great, it's great V brands out there. These are the last questions I'm gonna ask, unless something you ask makes me think of something else. Greg, um, we talked about a lot of change and how quickly, how rapidly things change. I just want you to talk to us about how do we communicate not only inside the community of schools but outside the community of schools to, to the Westerville community school is different how, how can we do that how can we help people understand sure thank you mr Villardo. um i'm going to begin with an apology because a long time ago in my career maybe 20 21 years i was asked a relatively simple question by a board of education member and when i finished up they said thank you i asked you for the time you told me how to build the watch <laughs> i really feel the need to tell you how we've built the watch <laughs> to help answer that question. 
Uh, so about 15 years or so ago, school districts really had a habit of relying on the local media to get their news out about what was happening inside their schools. Westerville City Schools was right there with them. Uh, also within the last 15 years, the broadcast and print media industries have undergone some real tremendous change. There have been multiple cycles of change in terms of how they're organized, how they report the news, the sources that are available to them to do so. Probably a, a great illustration of that is uh, back in 2013, the Chicago Sun-Times laid off their entire photography department, 28 people, and they got all of their reporters iPhones and taught them how to take photos and shoot videos with iPhones. So when you talk about change, when you talk about industries changing and how we have to be able to adapt and how our children have to be able to adapt, that's a pretty good example. Television stations also went through it. Uh, they went from having a camera person and a reporter assigned to basically every story to the reporter flying solo for everything. They set up a camera on a tripod. They set up the shot. They go and they do the, the stand-up. They close the camera down. They go back. They edit it. They basically do everything now. Every once in a while, you still get a two-person crew, but that's another uh, media industry that has changed. And there was also a thought at that time that began circulating amongst the media relations and communications community that, man, you look at all this, the news release is dead. It's no longer a viable tool for communications people to use. So upon seeing these changes when they first began to take place, we shifted our philosophy as a department. No longer could we rely on the news to carry our information, we decided that we were going to function as our own news organization. Previously, the Friday news uh, releases that uh, we still send out, that was only distributed to staff and the media. It was distributed to the media with the hope that maybe we'd get one or two stories placed, uh, and, and that was a good week. Now, the weekly news and announcements that we produce, they're still provided to our staff, they're still provided to the media, but we also send that out to every family. Uh, for the last 13 years, it's been like that. We've been sending it out to all families. So what started as a multi-page static PDF file is now uh, has evolved into an interactive electronic news publication. It continues the tradition of taking people inside our schools, breaking down those walls, it continues exceptional photographs so people can actually see those visuals of what's happening. And something I'm really excited about, most recently we've really started to expand the use of video. You heard Mr. Reeves reference that he's working with Charlie in our department to uh, produce something about uh, recruiting. Charlie's done a great job. It's been a great addition to the department. Um, we now augment that information with video clips and video stories that take people in there. YouTube, we have our YouTube channel. That's our, that's our TV network. So we've expanded into being our own news organization. In addition to those audiences, we have about 7,000 alumni and uh, about 11,000 community members in our distribution list, so our reach expands well beyond uh, our staff members in the media. Here's a, an interesting fact. When we send something electronically to everybody that we have in our news organ, or, I'm sorry, in our uh, database, we reach just over 43,000 people. And according to the media website Muckrack, that would make our news publication the uh, 15th largest newspaper in the state. Wow. <laughs> so the tools and strategies that we've put in place also help with our family and community engagement initiatives. We're better able to direct market involvement and engagement opportunities with our community, and we've also added some flexibility for them to be able to participate. While we're talking about the strategic plan, you heard Dr. Kellogg mention that uh, we did a refresh in 2017. We had about 100 people participate in that. It was two meetings, expected them to be here at a certain day, at a certain time, for a certain length of time, we had about 100 people. You also heard Dr. Ebrecht show that we had more than 1,300 people participate in the Name the Schools. Other recent successful engagement opportunities that we've used our thought exchange tool for are planning for the Summer Ignite program. That whole program was based on the feedback from students, staff, and families. And when we engaged the family in the facilities master planning process that Dr. Kellogg mentioned, we had about 2,500 people participate. 
I don't think I've ever seen a meeting with 2,500 people show up. So it, it really does expand and break down those barriers. Uh, probably one of the more interesting things that I've personally experienced since implementing the approach that uh, we use now is a shift in how people talk about our district news. 15 years ago, when we relied on the newspapers and TV stations, it was common to hear somebody say, we just have to do a better job of getting our news out. We just have to do a better job of getting our story out. Since functioning as our own news organization, it's become, why in the world didn't the news pick that up? That was a great story. So people realize that this is what we're sharing, but it's not always getting picked up. From a communication standpoint, our goal continues to be to take people inside our schools, share the stories of student and staff accomplishments, as well as highlight the innovative instruction that's taking place. But we also want to help each school implement and achieve minimum communication standards over the next few years. And then from an engagement standpoint, over the next few years, we want to help our building leadership teams create and strengthen opportunities for their families and learning communities to be engaged in their schools. The approach has to be consistent. It has to be about meaningful topics. And it has to use strategies that help overcome obstacles that would otherwise inhibit their learning communities from participating. So thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about uh, the watch that we've built. Thank you, Greg. Finished, Rick? <laughs> I have a couple more. <laughs> Um, well, let's, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Hopkins if he would come forward and, and take his spot at the podium for a moment. Uh, clearly, there is a significant amount in what was presented tonight that deals with teaching and learning and all of the variety that teaching and learning encompasses in this district and our complexity and with our size. And I'm wondering if you can, I'm not going to give you a terribly pointed watch to build, but I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about where you see us going as we move toward Port of Graduate work and also how you see teaching and learning shifting as we adapt to the change that's coming. And Dr. Kellogg, I really like what you said about we don't have to reinvent things, we have to capitalize on what we have. Mm -hmm. And when I think about teaching and learning, I think that's very key to that. Now that I called you up, I'm going to say something else. Please. But the whole idea is not that we are um, throwing out or rejecting everything we are, everything we've done. It has nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is shifting direction when it's important to do so, when the return on investment is there. And the term that I like to use is public return on investment because these are public dollars used to create the return. And then the importance of adaptability, and that goes directly to the heart of teaching and learning. So talk to us a little bit about Portrait of a Graduate sure. and about how you see these shifts impacting teaching and learning in this district. Great. Thank you for the question. And I uh, look forward to answering, hopefully, most of that in a short period of time. But um, it, you, when I came, I think it was a couple months ago, we were talking about our ESSER funds, our ARP funds. And I was talking about the different things that this money will allow for us to do. One of the things I didn't want is to create one more thing, is to create one more opportunity for our teachers on an already tremendously crowded plate. But it was looking for the best return on investment. What are the strategies that we have learned? And I think if anything has taught us as those videos in the last probably year and a half of teaching is that our teachers have learned a lot about our students and the way they learn. Our students have learned a lot on how they can assume more ownership and accountability of the learning. And so I always try to be optimistic. And you know, since March 2020, our students have learned that you know what, there's different ways to learn. There's different modalities at which I can learn. And our teachers have done that too. I'll use a quick story too. Um, one of the great things I love to do on a daily basis when I have time is to visit classrooms. And I had a chance to go to an elementary school just the other day. And it was a second grade classroom. And I just kind of walked in and quietly to that. And she goes, oh, don't worry, Dr. Hopkins. You know, they're used to visitors. You know, but they were all in little groups, independently learning, some with technology, some with collaboration, kind of peer learning with one another, teaching each other, some doing some silent reading by themselves. And the teacher was a facilitator. 
Traditionally, I think a couple years ago, you might have seen the teacher standing in front of the classroom doing a lot of direct instruction where the students were taking notes. But I asked her and I said, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about what kind of prompted this? And she said the last couple of years. She said, you know, with Schoology, with all of these new resources, with iReady, with some of the online, you know, the kids are more proficient with laptops and our Chromebooks. She said we can really harness that and leverage that to be really productive moving forward. And I think that that visit really told me a lot about the portrait of a graduate as well. There's six competencies there, and you had mentioned one of them actually, adaptability, communication, collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking. I saw all of that in about 15 minutes in a second grade classroom. And so I'm really excited about what our teachers are learning. Our curriculum department, led by Ms. Wallace, Ms. Baldwin, Cheryl Relfer, Dr. Knapp, have been doing some wonderful professional development at the high school level on standard-based learning so that we can really target the essential learning standards that our students need to learn. We've looked at at the elementary level using iReady, Lexia, other data, classroom data to identify what are the high leverage um, you know, strategies that we need to implement to ensure that our students are ready at third grade, no later than third grade for the reading guarantee, but also for those huge math skills that they're going to need to build on for the rest of the year. So, you know, I'm really excited. I think the last year has been, a, you know, a great opportunity for our teachers to receive some wonderful qual high quality professional development, but also our educators and our learners to say, you know what, there are different ways that I can demonstrate learning and our teachers harnessing and using that along the way. So the portrait of a graduate is going to really do both. We have this arrow that we talk about, not only is it deeper learning of the content standards and making sure the academic content is prioritized, but also what are these success skills? A lot of people call them soft skills. I like to reference them as success sk skills because those are what um, our learners are going to need to compete. We always say the 21st century, or we've, we've been here for a while now, 20 plus years, right? But um, those are the skills that are going to help them be successful, whether it's college, whether it's careers, whatever, it, whatever what they want to pursue and be successful with in the post-secondary you know, you know, life that they have. So there is a lot. I'm so excited, and I'm excited because there's so many wonderful educators. I know there's a few here today that I was talking to on the way in that are just so excited about the opportunity that the portrait of a graduate can help align. A lot of times districts have a lot of competing arrows. I think portrait of a graduate is really going to help align these arrows and ensure that they're all hitting the same mark so that whenever we look at purchasing curriculum, evaluating curriculum, we're looking at it in a very strategic, intentional way, equity focused as well, to ensure that we're doing what's best for all of our students. And that's another thing. I have the privilege of working with our students with disabilities, our English language learners, students who are identified as gifted. So when we say all learners, we truly mean just that, all learners to be successful in our district. And I'm really excited to be able to work with some of the most outstanding educators I've ever had the privilege of working with here in this district. Did that answer most of it? It does. Yes. And what you are saying, it's, it's kind of interesting because you, if you think about it, for years we talked about the importance of the whole child. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and when I say we, I'm talking about society. Mm -hmm. okay? We talk about the, the importance of the whole child. And yet, it was always rather difficult to hone in on what that meant and how we were going to really deal with that. Some people, you know, are really good at it intuitively, others not so much. And how do systems like this really focus in on what it means to develop a whole child? Uh, and when we look at the portrait of graduate work that you're spearheading here, and I look at those um, capacities mm -hmm. that we're trying to develop, mm -hmm. not only the academic capacities, but the success skill mm -hmm. capacities. Mm -hmm. What that is to me is the um, manifestation mm -hmm. of the whole child idea. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how we begin to, to roll that out more um, deliberately. It also, uh, in your comments, and you guys aren't going to be surprised when I say this, you're describing a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. All of these components, it's a Venn diagram. You're right. And <laughs> I know, I know everything in life to me is a Venn diagram. But when you're talking about that second grade classroom mm -hmm. that you were in, you're talking about that teacher, you're talking about all of the uh, components that we're asking our teachers to take on, the learning that we're asking them to do in addition to the learning they've already done, that drives straight back to the conversation that Scott Reeves was having with us as well. Because we cannot make all of these strategic kind of shifts happen 
unless we have the um, highly skilled, committed, dedicated people in, in our schools. Mm -hmm. We do, we've got them now, but we have to continue to bring additional people in. And uh, as Mr. Reeves was talking about, the serious decline in people who are entering education, we have to be looking at it not only from the perspective of race, as important as that is, but to the encouragement of children, young people from every arena. We need them in education. Our profession is suffering badly. And when I talk to parents, I say, have you talked to your child? Have they thought about education? Nine times out of 10, the answer is, oh no, I wouldn't want to do that. But yet there's nothing better than what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. There is no more noble. There are professions that are as noble, <laughs> but there is no more noble profession than helping to build children, young people, adults who can function in the changing world we're talking about. So when we talk about teaching and learning, it is inseparable from talking about human resources. It is inseparable from talking about communication. It is inseparable from talking about facilities and operations. All of those pieces have to be meshed together. I thank you. I know I'm not asking you a question. You're wondering, what the heck is she talking about now? <laughs> but the idea that I'm trying to get across is this is an opera, opera huh. oh, I wish I could take this off and say the word, operationalization of all that we have been working on with the strategic plan since 2013. So John, you were talking about the changes, the strategies, and so forth, and much is changing. The aspirations have not. And this society that is changing so rapidly, and the knowledge structure that are changing so rapidly, and the delivery systems that are changing so rapidly, the aspirations remain. And that's what we always have to build on, and that's what we need to get our young people focused on for themselves in whatever career they choose, but also in building the education profession. And uh, yeah, good luck. You, you go Thank make you. sure that happens, Paul. Well, I appreciate the support from the board as well. Thank you. Can I ask two quick follow-up questions while Dr. Hopkins is here? Thank you. Um, so thinking about curriculum adoption and selection mm -hmm. and adoption, we're talking about you know everything moving faster. And can you just talk briefly about how you see that changing in recent years and changes you might anticipate in the future? I mean, I think we're all familiar with mm -hmm. School districts used to buy textbooks. Right. They would have those same textbooks for a number of years. That's clearly not what we're doing now. Right. But if you could just tell us where we are and where you think we're going, that would be my first follow-up. Okay. Well, the, um, the cur curriculum adoption process is outlined in policy, and, and we are very deliberative and intentional to include all stakeholders and to allow for the community to come and view and you know, observe and reflect on different items. But we're also intentional about involving our WEA, our teachers, our educators, um, teachers on special assignments, some of our curriculum specialists to ensure that they are reading over their vetting. I think what we're seeing as a change now is, you know, it used to be, you know, hey, what's the best price on the best textbook with the most glamorous maps and transparencies and everything else that came with the resource. Now we're really looking at it with much more focus through an equity lens, for example. We have, I know Cynthia DeVise, um, has been working to provide us with some rubrics, for example, as we look through the curriculum um, materials to say, hey, is this truly a um, product or products that where all students can see themselves, where there's an appropriate balance of African American, Hispanic, you know, all, um, you know, you know, ethnics, um, you know, will be represented um, in an, um, an appropriate amount of way and to make sure that that's the process that we go through. Uh, we're trying to be very strategic because we know the era of, you know, hey, buying the best textbook was the most important thing. Now that's not always the case. We're looking at supplementary resources for our students with disabilities. I know our EL director, Dr. Lucy Rader Brown, is also heavily involved in this to ensure that, hey, this is something that our, you know, English language learners will find benefit from as well to ensure that it's matching with what the new teaching is the new teaching is involving a lot of instructional technology as well so we want to make sure that there's a lot and we also want evidence best practices we want to know what works not what's the shiny you know new you know program out there but what is the evidence what does the data say is also um, critical to that as well so that's just a quick snapshot of it if that's what uh, you're thank looking you. for and sure. I think what I, I see is that a lot of the materials are um, they are online and they continue to change. So you're mm -hmm. not buying a static. Exactly, yeah, right? very dynamic. Yep. Static material, mm -hmm. they're dynamic materials. Mm -hmm. um, and so then related to that, and I don't know if you were, Dr. Kello mm -hmm. is best to answer this, but 
Um, when we're relying so heavily on technology, we know that some kids are more familiar, especially at the young grades. Mm -hmm. Right, they come into school. Some kids already have familiarity. They've had, you know, high-speed internet at home. They got ten laptops. They got, you know, whatever Chromebooks, right. phones, and some kids don't. Right. And so, in those early years, and you know, maybe Mrs. Wallace, I, whoever wants to um, mm -hmm. talk about this, how are we sort of onboarding those youngest kids with the use of technology? Because that's a really important skill in this future world. I, th I think you'll see a couple of things. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that one, but I'm going to add on a little bit to what Dr. Hobson said in terms of curriculum. And not, not just talk about curriculum, but, but talk about lesson design, which is a teacher function, right? And that's probably where we see the greatest acceleration and changes. The standards for Algebra 1 aren't going to change a whole lot. Algebra 1 is kind of Algebra 1, right? But the approaches to teaching kids based on who those kids are, what experience they had, and what tools and, and you have at your fingertips may change the way you approach Algebra. Um, in terms of technology, I think what you'll find is many of the programs we use are built on exactly that, the age of the students and their familiarity with technology. Surprisingly, I actually I don't think it's surprising to most of us that most of these kids have some experience even as they come into kindergarten with some form of technology. So what you'll see is in design a lot of time in digital curriculum we're using is it reflects exactly the kind of environment the kids are used to seeing now, right? So gamification is something here a lot, right? you'll see that baked into some of the um, products that we're using at the younger grades, because kids are familiar with that, right? So, um, and then they build in that skill set over time uh, as they move through and, and get older and, and become more familiar. So there's a scaffolding of the products because the developers understand that. Um, and then I think you're also driving a little bit at the access issue that we have to, that we have to continue to look at. And so, when we built our, our learning and teaching roadmap several years ago, we built it on a premise of a ratio of two students per, per device. We're a, bit, a little bit ahead of that right now, but we're seeing and we've been having these conversations as we've entered this year and we'll bring that forward to the board here in, in the near future. We need, we need to up our ante. We need to go to the next level and discuss what that looks like, what the funding for that looks like, um, what does that mean in terms of number of devices and kids access and, and things like that. At the same time, maintaining a balance between technology as a tool for instruction and human interaction. So, um, we, you know, uh, each student is different. Um, each teacher is different in the way they design the lesson instruction. We don't want to be too dependent. But I'll go back to that quote I heard Heather McGowan say in there about where we're going to an augmentation. It's no longer learning how to do Excel. It's working with uh, technology a side by side as a partner in the work you're doing um, in coordination with that work. And that's, for me, that I'm not quite sure what that really is as an experience yet, but I know it's out there, AI technology that people are getting into that I think is going to revolutionize a lot of things that we're seeing. And we're already seeing that in some places, right? Um, so a, a great example would be some of the digital curriculum we use that um, scaffolds itself depending upon student response. So depending on a student response to a particular question, it's, and it's that response and what it means in terms of students' success to that standard, it'll then take them to another level, whether or not that's back for some remediation, forward sequentially to the next logical step, or accelerate past that because they've demonstrated skills. There's an interaction in there that, um, from the technology that wasn't there you know, 10 years ago, um, and it's become much more sophisticated. Um, so short answer is, I think you see the technology we're using in the classrooms is scaffolded to where those kids are in their understanding. And we know we need to go to the next step if we're going to support this portrait of a graduate, 21st century learning, knowing what the world is these kids are in. A ratio of two kids per one device ain't going to cut it. In, um, in, uh, we're now fourth of the way into the 21st century, so let's call it what it is, right? Um, I'll never forget a couple years ago, I have a brother who works in IT at a university, and I was asking about one to one. And his response to me, he chuckled, said, one to one? He said, we're three to one. I said, what do you mean? He said, they got their gaming device, their phone, and their, and their, their laptop, all the students on their network. And that's what they're, in, and so we know a lot of our students are bringing their phones too. So with phones, devices. Um, so we'll be bringing more information forward to the board for their consideration <coughs> as we move forward. To where do we want to go next with how instructional technology supports the overall program and points in the direction of supporting a portrait of our graduate skills? Thank you for all of that. And I, and I know a really important part of that is um, helping our teachers learn 
how to use these various instructional Correct. technologies. And we could talk for like three hours about the kind of <laughs> professional development that goes into that. But I just want to um, urge that, you know, that's that continues to be, and I know it will, but that continues to be a really important focus and that continuing um, PD for our teachers who have dealt with so much the last couple years. Um, and I've heard many of them say and seen online teachers say, you know, things like, well, I was sort of resistant to Schoology, but now I really know how to use Schoology, right? And so it just takes that concentrated effort in helping people really learn how to use the tool. So thanks for, um, you know, all the work that's been done, particularly around Schoology in the last couple of years. We may love it or hate it, and, you know, I got my own feelings on those things, but um, but I know that it's it's come to be a useful tool that a lot more people now know how to use. Um, Dr. Hopp, I don't know whether you're the best one to answer this, or you, Dr. Kellogg. Uh. <laughs> um, could you say a little bit about our work with the portrait of a graduate and what that is? It's been incorporated a lot in the conversation that's taken place. Mm. There may be some who don't know exactly what that is, where it came from, and what we're talking about doing with it. So I'm going to split this with you, Dr. Okay. Hopkins. That's I'm going to let you talk specifically about um, how we got to where we're at. But I want to point out, the portrait of the graduate work we're doing is not in isolation as a Westville thing by itself. This is a larger network across the country of school districts that are, are some of them are behind us in terms of their process, some of them are at the same point we are, and some of them are three or four years ahead of us in terms of it. And so in our process, we're going from the graphic, what does the portrait look like in the competencies and the prettiness of it, to practice. And so. I want to point out, we're not doing this alone and charting the path. We're following um, a number of school districts that are well into this and are seeing changes in the way their kids are experiencing education in schools in ways that we think are of value. So, Paul, I'll let you take it from there. No, and I'll just add on to that. Um, we're working in a collaboration with Patel for Kids and many other districts. In fact, it's starting up this Friday, a session on deeper learning so that we can really, and I say we, um, Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Wallace, um, Ms. Relford, uh, Dr. Knapp, and um, Don Sayer, our new College and Careers um, Director. Uh, we're going to be learning alongside other partnering districts. And I think that's something we don't do enough in education. We kind of work in isolation quite a bit. But we've got some not only local but national districts that we can partner with to learn. And we're going to move from this portrait, a beautiful graphic that our communications team is in the process of developing. And I've shared with you a short edit and we've kind of refined it a little bit more. Um, but we want to move beyond a graphic because I've worked with a lot of districts where the portrait of a graduate was a beautiful poster that the school board had in their offices and it was plastered along the walls. We want to move beyond that. So we're going to move from portrait to practice. So what's going to happen is Don Sayers leading a lot of this work is to really dive deep into how does this look in an elementary school? How does this look in a middle school and a high school? And it could be, for example, a capstone project that our middle schoolers are doing that demonstrate that their ability to collaborate, communicate, um, do some problem solving with one another, adapt as necessary, and really produce something as opposed to demonstrating their learning on a high stakes test that we know has some limitations as well. So we think that this capstone project that the uh, Portrait of a Graduate will do, and it's nothing in isolation. We're going to be reaching out to our community. One of the things that Summer Ignite offered us, kind of a sandbox to play with this summer, was to reach out to some of our community. Some of the folks in our own transportation department, our communications department, and then now even we're expend extending it to some in our uh, Westerville chamber, is to look at how can these students get out of the classroom and demonstrate these competencies in a real world situation that prepare them for experiences that probably we never had that were just confined to the classroom. So we're really going to be intentional about really trying to make sure that we're harnessing and leveraging all the resources that those wonderful, rich Westerville community has to um, expand our learning. Because that's something that we're really doing and our teachers are just, you know, ready to roll on this in a lot of ways. As we do, though, want to lead them. I think, Miss um, Altman, you were talking about the professional development. We just don't want to give them the graphic either. We want to make sure that they understand, you know, 
you know, that it's not just collaboration for collaboration's sake, um, and they know that, but it's also offering and modeling and giving them some ideas on how they can do that. But really, they're the experts, and we're going to learn from them, and we're going to showcase their learning and their um, demonstration of um, wonderful work that I think we're going to be extremely proud of. And it's not going to be, you know, something that at the end of this year we're going to um, perfect. You know, I'm someone that wants to go slow in order to go far. And so we're going to spend this year to be very um, deliberate about that, make sure it's done right. And so it's something that every, from pre-kindergarten all the way through their senior year, it's, you know, we say a portrait of a graduate, but it's not something they just demonstrate as a senior. It's something, it's almost a portrait of a learner, if you think of it that way, too. So it's some skills that they're developing and then maturing as they progress and matriculate through our um, school system. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, one more question. Not for you, Dr. Hopkins, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dorn, um, if you could come, part of what was also mentioned in the presentation was that our learning spaces um, should be, there it is, uh, should be uh, inspiring. Um, could you share with us some of the aspects of what makes our buildings inspiring as well as we have two new buildings going up what are some of the elements in those buildings the um the the, the remodeling that's taking place at south what are some of the inspiring aspects of um of our buildings well uh, president bell members of the board i appreciate you asking this question i would like to say i'm going to keep this very short because i'm going to prime the next board meeting where I'm doing a facilities update presentation. <laughs> but what I'd like to just say is that, you know, one of the things that we know that we need to do is we need to listen and we need to understand what, what people are asking for that makes them want to come to school every day. So when you look at the new um, addition at Anhurst Elementary, part of the things that the students were asking for when we went and asked the students, you know, they were asking for um, more light. Anhurst had almost no light in the building. No walls, no light, right? So when you start cutting out windows into their cafeteria space or into classrooms or creating a, a windowed treehouse effect for them, they find that, to, my belief is they find that to be a place where they really want to come to. Uh, so that's what we're talking about when we're thinking about inspirational. When you look at Westerville South and you go to, just if you just are just still talking about phase one, where uh, you know the students there asked us for natural elements to be included in the design and so we included those as wayfinding in the building so the water wing is the blue wing so they always know what they're talking about but when you start talking about how those pendant lights look like a waterfall or the the waterfall graphic sponsored by the westerville sunrise rotary you start thinking about all those breakout spaces where kids can come together and work independently or work in collaborative in, in a collaborative nature with technology and things that support them, those are, it makes them feel like we're hearing them and we're understanding what it is that they need. So you start looking at our new elementary, it's gonna be a great building, our new middle school. You know, all of these different aspects are going into our plan. Here's the thing about it though, we've got a lot of buildings in our district. And as we go building by building, project by project, we're having the opportunity to provide these types of spaces as we move forward. So as we're looking at Whittier and Hawthorne right now, those two buildings are on, on the design table. And with Whittier and Hawthorne, Whittier is gonna require a small addition. So that small addition can be something a little bit more special than what's existing in the building right now. At Hawthorne, it's a different animal because at Hawthorne, we're not doing many hard wall changes. So how do we find that inspiration there? The great thing about it is we have an excellent team. So on the team, I'm more of the practical functional guy. So I probably shouldn't answer a lot about the inspiration co component to it. But Mr. LaRose, Triad Architects and, his, and their team, they do a great job finding some of these spaces. So I intend to highlight them at the September 27th board meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jill, can you go to the last slide again? So that second bullet point, 
I think it would be impactful when we have their hire, develop, and retain if we could add in there somehow um, staff that reflects the student body. I, I already made that change on my resume. Okay, so I was <laughs> I just. I think that's a trans. I actually think that's a transfer mistake that I made from a, a document. So yeah, I agree. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Not after that comment. You could read my eyes. I'm good. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Kellogg, uh, members of the staff. Thank you for um, sharing with us this evening. Um, a lot of good work um, that has been done is continuing to be done, and we look forward to uh, future updates on. Um, this work as we progress through it. Continuing um, with our agenda for this evening, um, agenda item uh, 6.01, uh, public comments for agenda items. Um, we have none for this evening um, here. Moving on to agenda item seven, our financials. Um, agenda item 7.01, uh, resolution to approve the purchases in accordance with ORC 5705.41D1 and board policy 6320. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Ms. Marshall, would you please share with us? Yes, thank you, President Bell and members of the board. Um, so this is a then and now purchase order in which we need the board's approval in order to pay. Um, this is a case where we have an invoice date that is prior to a purchase order date and the amount is in excess of $3,000. So this was for a um, software renewal for, for our food services uh, program and uh, the money was budgeted for. It was a matter of timing with the invoice and the renewal and so I would recommend that the board approve the purchase in front of them. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Marshall? Okay, Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. That motion carries. Um, agenda item 7.02, um, audit committee notice. Um, Ms. Marshall, would you please share with us? Yes, thank you again. So um, it's that time of year for us, so we enjoy the company of our auditors about six months out of the year, uh, preparing for and working with them, um, getting our financial or annual financial report together, uh, the comprehensive annual financial report. It's great reading if those, <laughs> if nobody has seen that, it's available on the district's website. Um, so we have an audit committee that uh, includes five community members. So we have three vacant positions. Uh, I want to thank uh, Al Hammond, Keith Gaskins, and Eric Tyre. Uh, they are retiring from the audit committee. Uh, joining us again for this year will be uh, Dory Christian and Sue Holschler. And so we um, need three more folks to join us. Uh, it's not a huge time commitment. I'm happy to spend as much time with anybody that's interested to serve on the audit committee and anything you'd want to learn about the district's audit. Um, but we will post it starting tomorrow. Uh, so again, there's three positions. It'll be available on the district's website and it will run through September the 24th. And um, the only real requirements that our board policy has for the audit committee is that uh, the members be um, professionals that are uh, familiar with the district operations and accounting and auditing procedures, that sort of thing. So not a lot of requirements there. Um, and this, they serve for one year term and that is renewable um, by the executive team. And we will bring the applicants back for the board's consideration um, at the last meeting in October, so October the 24th. So I hope to have lots and lots of interest. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ms. Marshall. Uh, moving on to agenda item 7.03, uh, resolution to approve insurance premiums for calendar year 2022. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. 
And Ms. Marshall, would you share with us about this also? Yes, so um, these, this is for calendar year 2022. It's our annual uh, plan year for all of the district's insurances. Um, I'm happy to report that we are seeing no increase for our dental, vision, and life insurance, but group life insurance plans. Um, there is an increase of 6.3% with our medical insurance plan, which is still great news. Um, we were projecting an 8% based on trend, so we were pretty happy with it coming in at 6.3% based on where we are with the plan usage. So um, that is before the board, and I would recommend its approval. Okay, thank you, Ms. Marshall. Any questions? Discussion? All right, Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Mr. Velarda? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. That motion carries. Moving on to agenda item eight, our personnel consent agenda, which is comprised of <coughs> agenda items 8.01 through 8.11. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Okay. Mr. Reeves, would you please share with us about this evening's personnel consent agenda? Yes. Thank you and good evening once again, President Bell, members of the board, Dr. Kellogg and Mrs. Marshall. I'd like to present to you tonight for your consideration the personnel consent agenda. The items in tonight's relatively brief agenda represent our regular action items with regard to personnel, but there are a few items that I would like to note in tonight's agenda. We actually have no retirements this evening, which means the board will get a brief reprieve on any history lesson regarding <laughs> the years of service for our <laughs> retirees. Uh, with the school year well underway, hiring for our licensed teaching staff is winding down. You'll notice only two requests for hires this evening. Uh, and you, we have no resignations in our teaching staff other than a few supplemental contracts. The board will notice quite a few one-time pay requests which reflect any salary and work adjustments from past approvals as well as additional services since the last board meeting. The personnel activity within our classified staff, however, is a little bit more active. We have a dozen resignations of regular staff along with a few substitutes, which center mostly around food service and cafeteria recess aides employees. However, we do have 15 regular hires, which mostly fill those vacant positions and also includes an English learner para and three success coaches. So that pretty much is the summary of tonight's agenda. If I answer any questions that you may have. How are we doing with bus drivers? Uh, we're always looking for good qualified drivers. Uh, there's, there's always, I don't know an exact number, but good qualified drivers, uh, we'll take you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Reeves? Okay, thank you, Mr. Reeves. Thank you. Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes, and that motion carries. Moving on to agenda item nine, old business. There is none this evening. Agenda item 10, new business. Um, there is none this evening. Agenda item 11, uh, recommended actions and standing business. Agenda item 11.01, .01, a resolution authorizing the sale of real property pursuant to um, RC 3313.41. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Mr. Dorn, would you please share with us regarding this agenda item? Uh, yes, sir. Good evening again, President Bell, Vice President Dr. Nestor Baker, members of the board, Dr. Kellogg and Ms. Marshall. We partnered with the City of Westerville in their State Street sidewalk widening project. Relevant here is the portion of the project that took place in front of Hamby Elementary School in 2019. Widening the sidewalk not only supported our student bus loading and unloading process, but it also provided some beautification aspects to our building approach. As a continuation of the project, we need to provide right-of-way access to the city. Because this is an outright conveyance, we need to transfer. Uh, the transfer needs to fit under one of two statutes. In this scenario, the appropriate statute is 3313.41, which allows the district to sell unneeded property to the city, 
Ordinarily, this is a very complicated process, uh, process under the statute, but the process does not apply where the property is valued at less than $10,000. Given the small size of the parcel, 0 0.025 acres, roughly 1,000 square feet, it is clearly worth less than $10,000. Therefore, it is recommended the board approve the sale of the property to the city. Any questions? Okay. Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Oh, she sorry, I didn't out. see she, she stepped out. Mr. Villarda? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. That motion carries. <coughs> Moving on to agenda item 11.02, a resolution approving grant land owned by the school district to Columbia Gas for purposes of a utility easement. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Mr. Dorn. Yes, with the need to have natural gas service supplied to the new elementary school site, uh, the approval of this Columbia Gas easement is being presented. Columbia Gas requires an easement and right of way to provide the natural gas service needed. Thus, it is being recommended that the board grant the utility easement to Columbia Gas as shown uh, in the document attached. The board should anticipate a similar easement for the new middle school at a future board meeting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Dorn? Okay. Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Mr. Villardo? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. And that motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Dorn. Uh, moving on to agenda item 11.03, which is policy 2266, non-discrimination on the basis of sex and education programs or activities. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reeves, are you going to share with us about this policy update? Yeah, the update is, is really a, uh, an adjustment of position uh, with my role as Executive Director of Human Resources. Uh, the policy changes to uh, name me the Title IX coordinator for the district, and so that's the, that's the crux of what you're approving. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mr. Villarda? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. And that motion carries. Moving on to agenda item 12, um, agenda uh, public comments. Agenda item 12.1 is for our public comments. Um, just as a reminder, um, each speaker will have five minutes to address the board. Um, please remember to address your comments to the board. A timer will be shown on the screens, and Mr. Hershiser will call time when the five minutes has elapsed. Um, please remember to um, address your comments to the board and not to the audience. And if anyone has any materials that you would like um, to leave for the board's consideration, please uh, hand those to Mr. Uh, Hershiser. Our first uh, speaker for this evening is Courtney Mahovlik. Good evening. My name is Courtney Mahovlik. I'm a product of Westerville. I've lived here most of my life. My 14-year-old son is a freshman at Westerville Central High School and is on the football team. On August 9th, he was attacked in the freshman locker room by many juniors who are on the varsity team. When I say attacked, I mean he, he was surrounded by these older boys, thrown to the ground and held down. One boy grabbed him in between his legs and then proceeded to put his fingers in his butt. While he was still down on the floor, all the boys kicked him repeatedly and told him, you are the first this year, and left. Bef before leaving the locker room, these boys tried unsuccessfully to initiate two other freshman players. This was not a targeted single attack that occurred because these boys had a problem with my son. Let's be honest and call it what it is. This is hazing. 
You preach zero toler tolerance, but how is an eight-day suspension zero tolerance? No one from the school informed me of the attacker's suspension on, wh on when he would be back to school. My son has been through enough trauma, and to see the attacker at school without any preparation shocked him, to say the least. Policies need to be changed. Make it fair for the ones who speak up about the wrongdoing rather than continue to victimize them even more. You may be saying to yourself, why would I come forward and identify myself and by doing so identify my son? My son was identified the day after the attack by those who participated and by those who witnessed it and who openly discussed that what happened. He stood alone when he was attacked in that locker room. I will not allow him to stand alone any longer. Although I have used the words victim by referring to the attack and the reporting of it, I want to be very clear. My son is not a victim. He will not allow himself to be. Yes, he was attacked, assaulted, and kicked, but he is not a victim. He is a war hawk, something he has wanted to be since he was five years old. Although there are those who have suggested that he might be wise to go to another school, he will not. He will continue to attend Westerville Central. He will walk the halls, attend classes, participate in sports, and be just like every other Central student because he will not be deprived. He is smart, he is strong, he is brave, but he is not a victim. When he told me of this attack, it was not easy for him to do. After the first waves of shock and anger had passed, I told him I was proud of him for sharing with me something that was so difficult to talk about. He told me he had to. He had to because what he, they did to him was wrong, and he didn't want it to happen to anyone else. That's why I am here tonight. This must not happen to anyone else. So how do we get here? If you read some of the postings on Facebook, you are led to believe this is not an isolated event. Some have said, this was going on when I was in school. It's a rite of passage, and one even called a tradition. Let's be clear, this is not a tradition. Traditions are things that we share together, we are proud of, we celebrate and, and applaud. Things we want to share with your parents. This is none of those. Some say the boys had made bad decisions, got caught up in the moment, were joking around. This was none of those things. This was an attack, an act of bullying and an assault. A parent shared with me after her sons heard of the attack, they told her that they too had experienced something similar their freshman year, and they also go to Central. This affected her so deeply that she felt compelled to file a police report after the fact. Although principals, administration, and the Genoa police chief have reported referred to these comments and statements as rumors, I am not one that believes if you ignore a situation, it will go away. If we compel people to share their experiences, we must be prepared to listen to what they say and if justified, take action. And how about the timing of these actions and what point should parents and students be notified? There have been zero changes with the Westerville Central program. Changes need to be made and they need to be made now. I will not stop and still, until my son gets justice. The, our next speaker um, is Nicole Tufts. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Nicole Tufts. I have three kids that are in the Westerville School District that has been victims of bullying. But I'm here to advocate for my seventh grade son who attends Heritage Middle School. My son has dealt with suicide at the end of last year due to bullying at Heritage Middle School. I'm sick to my stomach. I was sick to my stomach at the thoughts of school was approaching so soon. Week one and two came with no problem. 
week, week three, I would get, I would receive a call. I'll never forget. My son screaming and crying, begging for me to hurry and pick him up. The coach is nowhere to be found. He's hurt. He's scared. He stated that he has been, just been sexually assaulted and beat up by three, bo by three of his football teammates, two being our captains. I also learned that this wasn't the first time that coach is nowhere to be found and these three boys and my son were alone for this to happen. Heritage will claim otherwise. Per their report, this is just a case, sorry. Heritage will claim otherwise. Per their report, this is just a case of boys will be boys messing around, that my son was upset, that these boys were picking on him for missing a play or so, and that my son went in the locker room kicking and screaming, and that is why this has happened. These boys were depancing, slapping backsides, roughhousing, and that they have done their investigation and that the case is closed, will not be reopened. When contacting Dr. Kellogg to state the report that the school has given me is false and untrue. He states that he will look into it and get back with me. I received a call back stating that the case is closed and it cannot be appealed, but I'm more than welcome to send my son's statement of what happened. I won't go into details too much, but my son was thrown up against a locker, thrown on the ground, held down, de-pantsed, pri privates grabbed, while he is begging for them to stop. Then they acceded to beat him, beat on him, causing him a concussion. My son has lost so much due to this incident, no longer a part of the football team has to see his attackers in first and second period and lunch, receives trauma therapy, counseling with the school counselor, panic attacks daily, flashbacks. I wake my son up two and three times a night over night terrors where he's screaming and crying for them to stop. He's been blamed by his team that they lost a game due to him quitting because of a fight. He's lost friends. My son feels as though as not only he, his principal, athletic director, coach, and team has let him down. Our district needs to wake up. Kids are being affected daily under their care. Thank you. Our next speaker um, is Tyson. I'm sorry, I can't make out the last. McConaughey. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, my heart goes out to the, the moms that, that just spoke. I've got, I'm a dad of two boys in the district, and, and those stories break my heart. So. But uh, President Bell, Super, Superintendent Kellogg, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Thank you for the opportunity to make these comments. You know, we're now entering the third academic year of the ongoing pandemic, and based on a statement out of the World Health Organization last week that stated COVID-19 is likely here to stay as it continues to mutate and will be akin to the flu, meaning that COVID isn't going anywhere anytime soon. That likelihood needs to be weighed heavily in implementing policies that dictate how we move forward together as a society with COVID. When this all started 18 months ago, we didn't know what we were dealing with, which I believe justified the measures that were put in place at the beginning of the pandemic. However, now we are a year and a half into this, we have a significant amount of data that should be considered when making uh, and creating policies, especially those that relate to our kids. I wanna focus on two data points that are really difficult to focus on, but I think it's important when it comes to creating and implementing policies that impact our children, as well as their learning environment. 
Those two data points are hospitalization rates and deaths. This isn't a topic I ever wanted to spend time on educating myself or speaking to anyone in this room about tonight. But as a father of two boys, I believe it is my responsibility to truly understand what the risks are. The first data point I want to share with you comes from a study published on the CDC website last Friday. And I'll leave a copy in the back. That study was conducted in 99 counties across 14 states. Based on the finding in that study, the cumulative risk of a child or adolescent becoming hospitalized with COVID between March 1st and August 14th, 2021 was 0.049%, meaning that the average child or adolescent had a 99.995% chance of not being hospitalized for COVID during the almost six month period of the study. And that is before you stratify any of the data for underlying conditions that will put a child at greater risk uh, to severe disease from COVID that will require hospitalization. Happy to share the link with that study and I have a copy I'll leave in the back. I wanna qualify my next comments by saying that I'm, on, I'm not at all trying to minimize the loss of any life um, when I refer to the number of deaths related to COVID. There's some level of risk involved with pretty much every decision we make every day. For me as a dad, this data point is of course the most critical. Based on the numbers published on the CDC website to capture all deaths with COVID sorted by age category since the beginning of the pandemic through September 8th, 2021, here's how the numbers break out for the zero to 17 year old cohort. There have been 412 deaths with COVID, meaning that comorbidities might've been involved since the beginning of the pandemic. During that same period of time, there have been 924 deaths, more than, half, more than double of the, of the number of COVID deaths involving pneumonia or the flu and a total of 55,352 deaths in this age category nationwide, again, since the beginning of the pandemic. Meaning that deaths with COVID account for less than 1% of all deaths for children and adolescents age zero to 17. We've known for quite some time that healthy children are at very low risk of severe disease with COVID. The question I pose to the board, as well as our public health officials, is what is the justification in place for the policy recommendations and why do they continue to be in place? It will take years, if not decades, to truly understand the damage that has already been done to our children over the past 18 months. I respectfully request that the board and our public health officials consider the example set by our friends across the pond in the United Kingdom, where up until this point, they had basically been more strict than we have um, with regard to lockdowns and, and COVID related measures. They've now entered the new school year, making sure that they're vaccinating the, the children that are most at risk, and they're returning to schools with no quarantine policies or mass mandates. Because after looking at the data, they realized that the damage being done to their children by imposing these policies was far greater than any potential reduction in the spread of COVID. Thank you, and I look forward to your feedback. Thank you. Um, our next speaker um, is Satin Hurlbut. Oh, thanks, number one, for getting my name right. Um, so again, I got, just got thrown off. Sir, they don't care about masks. I know y'all told me not to address this, but you just listened to two mothers talk about how their children were treated. You want to come in here and talk about masks? Ma'am. I'm going back. Don't worry. I'm on task. All right. Good evening, Reverend Bell, members of the board, Dr. Kellogg. I sat down and thought long and hard about what I should choose to address tonight. But honestly, there are so many things to be said. We are sending our kids to school in a district that refuses to accept accountability and to protect them. I stand here today with friends parents of the district, and even parents that are not part of our district to call for change. Last meeting, we were promised investigations into the racist remarks and attacks at Walnut Springs. That was my second time hearing that it would happen. Thanks, Dr. Kellogg. I have to assume that nothing came of it because the student was never disciplined. Instead, the school staff addressed the rules about fighting and taking videos of incidents that happen within the walls of the building, which are the two children who were suspended, not the racist. <sighs> but no reiteration on the discipline regarding use of harmful racist language or death threats. 
per the handbook, prohibited racial harassment occurs when unwelcome physical, verbal, or nonverbal conduct is based upon an individual's race or color when the conduct is the purpose, has the purpose of or effect of interfering with the individual's work or educational performance. And then regarding those death threats, the handbook states, students shall report any information concerning weapons and or threats of violence by students, staff members, or visitors to the principal. Failure to report such information may subject the student to disciplinary action. Why weren't those highlighted? Why did we spend time, again, vilifying the children who were the victims of a racist attack? So many questions. So last month, Again, Dr. Kellogg chastised me and reminded me that personal meetings are his preference, and this is the reason why we're all still here. It shows that we have to fight these issues openly. These are not secrets. They're not rumors. I have emails from Dr. Kellogg that told me that these are rumors. They're sitting right there. These are people. The next issue is the way that you guys handled these sexual assaults. How is sexual assault a learning opportunity, since it went out in email? Why hasn't the school district addressed all of us, but only the fall sports families? The victim shaming, the refusal to report when most or all of staff are mandated reporters, the gaslighting, the fear tactics brought by the principals and our Westerville PD resource officers who are in our schools. They use those tactics to try to get these parents not to file charges. The coaches in the middle school were aware, as you heard, of the same assaults happening for days. The high school has apparently had this issue since 2014. All of the students are aware of this. What does that say to our children? Sports, sports are everything, even if you're penetrated or your privates are touched without your consent. If you aren't aware of what the district is hiding, the Susie report has spoken to these ladies, published both interviews. He also reached out to the district for comments, hasn't heard anything back, and the district is continuing to purport their, uh, their agenda. To file a charges on a sexual assault victim? That sounds very fair. You are not protecting these children from their attackers. None of this is acceptable and will never be. Westerville's media image of being zero tolerance is just that. It is just an image. This is my final call to action. Please, just protect our kids. We don't care about your shiny image. Earlier, Dr. Kellogg, uh, you mentioned our path forward and what we were gonna do to you know, bring our, parent, our children in to be safe and whole. You are not doing that. With my last 38 seconds, I would like to, uh, publicly endorsed Christy Meyer for school board. I wish that more people were running. If you're not aware, three seats are up. Nancy, Rick, Tracy, one of your time is up. We're done. And honestly, I wish it was the three of you. And since I've emailed you all and you've all chose not to respond, that is, that is where I am today. And Tracy, for you, I don't want to be your Facebook friend. Anything you want to say to me, you can say here in this forum, not online. You all sit here silently and display willful ignorance and a lack of regard for our children. And it ends now. Our next speaker is Brandy Green. Good evening, my name is Brandy, and while my children in, are not in this district, we are just in the neighboring district of Olentangy, and yet I am here addressing the board members, President Bell and Dr. Kellogg. I am an admin of a, who run, uh, sorry, one of the admin who run a local Facebook group of Westerville and surrounding area moms, and I have repeatedly read statements from both the police department and the school administrators of this district talking about rumors, social media talk, and drama, so I am sure that you are probably considering my presence here to be connected to the so-called rumors with false outrage. However, I still believe it takes a village. We have built up quite a village of mothers together. I have personally talked with both victims or their parents in great details. 
The experiences should leave every parent angry, horrified, saddened, and fed up. The experiences of these children within this district go from constant bullying, harassment, racial discrimination, physical, and even sexual assault. I have sat in the police station holding hands with a scared but very brave mother who is currently trying to seek justice for her child who is being let down on all accounts from the school administration, coaches, athletic department, resource officers, and quite frankly, the entire district. My son was bullied, pushed, hit, had rocks thrown at him daily until we had to pull him out of Westerville City Schools. I ended up putting my daughter in both counseling and boxing in hopes she'd feel empowered against her bullies. My child was called gay and punched. My special needs child was left with bruises and handprints. My child is now in counseling because he wants to commit suicide after all of this. These are a very small fraction of direct quotes I was given by parents and friends that I have made in this district. If I sat and read all of the comments I was given, we would be here all night. Sexual assault is being downplayed to boys will be boys. Victims are being played for their part in their attacks. Parents of the victims in this district are feeling like their hands are being tied, they are being gaslighted and ignored, and they're feeling desperate and quite frankly alone. Um, children are committing suicide as young as 10 years old and up at very alarming rates. And we can argue semantics all day long on why that is happening, but at the very least, bullying, racial discrimination, physical and sexual assault are contributing factors. I am here as both a support system for all of these parents I have met, as well as a concerned mother myself, as our districts are only right down the street from each other, and I believe that this harmful and toxic behavior is contagious when it is shown that it is accepted. I am here asking that you take a much closer look at what is going on in your schools. I am asking that you believe these victims when they come forward. I'm asking that we set a new precedent and take an actual no tolerance stance when it comes to the bullying, racism, physical, and sexual assault that is going on within your schools and athletic departments. I am asking you make your school a safe place for all students and no longer something that they dread for a large amount of them. And lastly, we are asking that you show your coaches, teachers, administrators that are turning a blind eye, downplaying, ignoring, or even blaming these victims that their participation is just as problematic as the actual perpetrators. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Rudy. Uh, good evening, Dr. Kellogg, members of the board, President Bell. Uh, yeah, my presentation is not nearly as heavy as what everybody else has said. I really, uh, my heart goes out to what you guys have all said about the bullying. I'm uh, pretty new as a parent in Westerville schools. I was a student in Westerville, grew up in Westerville, so did my wife. Uh, we moved to Westerville uh, about six years ago into a neighborhood called the Village at Westbury, uh, which is just south of Dempsey Road at Sunbury Road. And uh, I'm the president of our HOA, and uh, I wanted to talk about the realignment plan. Uh, I apologize, late to the party. Uh, I had not heard about the plan to um, change what schools our neighborhood would go to until about six days ago. Uh, my daughter, Cora, just started a kindergarten in McVeigh. And uh, yeah, the, the plan uh, assigns us to Wilder and to the new Minerva Park Middle School. Um, and I asked our neighborhood what they thought about it because, I mean, I talked to people, nobody mentioned it. I uh, put out a survey on our neighborhood website, uh, got about I got 36 responses. We have 131 lots. 70% of the people, uh, so they have negative views of the switch to the elementary and middle schools. Um, and about 20% are neutral. One person had a positive view of the elementary change. Nobody had a positive view on the middle school change. 70% of the people had not heard about this plan uh, before the past month. And most of them had not heard about it first from Westerville schools. It was word of mouth. It was my communication. 
I just tried to present it neutrally, you know, what do you guys think? And some of the common responses I got were, um, we moved here because of the schools assigned to our neighborhood. If these are changed, we're considering moving away. Uh, certainly my wife feels that way. She went to McVeigh and loves it. We both are really impressed with the quality of McVeigh and uh, just the staff there. Um, a lot of people said they weren't aware of the period of public comment last year. I, I listened to one of the presentations about all the communications you guys do. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to downplay that. Uh, I think the situation in our neighborhood is that uh, most of the people who have kids, their kids are little. Uh, we have about a dozen families with kids who are under the age five. Uh, they would not have a chance to be on the Westerville schools email list, uh, you know, whatever other communications that, you know, they did not, they were not aware of this, uh, else they would have commented uh, when the public comment period was uh, active. Uh, people were saying it sounds like our neighborhood is no longer part of the city of Westerville. And that's one of the things I wanted to point out is that uh, we're the southeastern corner of Westerville. The city limit is in my backyard. But people, uh, a lot of people I've talked to say we move here because this is Westerville. This is a great location. Uh, and they've been, f I know a lot of this is not your fault. Uh, felt a little bit ignored by the city for some of the services, some of the uh, Infrastructure kind of sound kind of feels like we're not really part of it, but we are. We pay city taxes. Um, people are, you know, people who do have children attending these schools. Uh, one of them said to me in person. I asked him, "Have you heard of the, the the plan to change the schools?" And he says, "Well, my opinion doesn't matter. They'll just do what they want to do." But actually, when I started educating myself, I looked through the the reports that were presented here earlier this year, and I was really impressed with. Um, you know, the feedback, the ways that uh, the plan was changed to accommodate the feedback from certain neighborhoods, like my parents in uh, Freedom Colony, their, their um, school was changed in response to that. And so I think you're, the board listens. And I was really impressed with that. Uh, but McVeigh and Walnut Springs have always been our schools. We understand the desire for neighborhood schools. Wilder is not in our neighborhood. There's actually a big barrier on the road between our neighborhood and Sunbury Woods where Wilder is. I don't know why, but we're very different neighborhoods. And uh, I think uh, the vast majority of people in our neighborhood would like to keep McVeigh and Walnut Springs as our schools. If this plan happens, uh, this would make our neighborhood uh, one of only three to not attend any schools inside the city of Westerville. Not Wilder, not the Newman River Park School, not um, Central. Those are all outside of Westerville that makes us feel like we're not part of the city. So what can we do to keep our current schools? That's all I wanted to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker for this evening is uh, Lisa Foley. Hello. Um, I had a lot of different things I wanted to say tonight, and I kind of got mixed up by hearing what some people were saying. And I want to give my support to Courtney and to the girl that was talking about her son at Heritage. Um, my heart just breaks for them. It's not anything a kid should have to go through. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start off and say, you know, when I think of Westerville, you know, I think about homes and friends, community, Fourth Fridays, kids running and playing, hanging out at Dairy Queen. One of those kids that I think about is Courtney's son. And if you don't know him, he's an incredible child. Oh my gosh. Knowing this child, I mean, he is a force of energy. He brightens every room that he walks into. He has friends that play soccer, friends that play baseball, friends from all over that do all different things. But he's a standout. And the reason he's a standout is his personality. It's, it's dynamic. He's kind. He's considerate. He is a joy to be around. 
I'm lucky that he is called a friend to my daughter and to our family. He's the type of kid that you are in a parking lot and he screams across the street, I love you, man, to my husband. I love you. Like you instantly love this child. There's no process in the school that holds coaches accountable and the athletic programs accountable. And Dr. Kellogg, you talked about social well-being of our children and that you have resources for that. That's great, we need that because although the fight is over, right? They knocked him around, they punched him, kicked him. Honestly, I close my eyes and I'm angry that this kid, this happened to this child in a school. Like, we have to make things different. Does the coach have to be in the locker room with the kids and babysit them? I guess so. But we need some sort of accountability here so it doesn't happen again. The poor kid at Heritage, oh my God. Like, I don't know, we send our cool, the only thing as a parent is we want our kids safe. We want them happy, we want them healthy, right? If your kid doesn't have mental health and doesn't have a strong support system, the effects of what happened to these two children will last for a very long time. And their mental health, I know you can't control everything at school, but you can put some of those resources into what you said for social being and teach our coaches to be leaders. Give them continuing education like you do your teachers. Help them understand what's the mind of a 14-year-old or a 12-year-old. My daughter's on cheer um, at Westerville Central, and she's a freshman. She's a ton of stress. Recently, we've been in a really bad situation, and thank you to Paul Hopkins. I know he's in the room, and I haven't had a chance to meet him yet, but he's kind of mediating what I'm dealing with at Central. I don't want to get into specifics, but it's bad. The coach had a bad decision process that she did with my child which caused my child an extreme amount of stress. Thank God for the athletic director who stepped in and made the situation correct. However, the emotional stress is weighing on her. Just like it's probably weighing on Courtney's child and, and the other girl's child. My daughter doesn't know if she wants to do this going forward. It's sad because she wants to be with her friends. There's studies that show that kids join sports to be with their friends. They want to have fun. They want to, this should be like the best years of their lives, playing these high school things and having memories, but there needs to be a process. How our coaches are educated, how they're put on a team to be the leaders, and how they empower children, encourage children, and help the kids be their best selves. With that being said, you need to take time to ask kids what's important to them, where do they want to be, what goals do they have. The coaches have to be the leaders. I know, I need one more minute. The coaches have to be the leaders. Sorry. And as educators in the school board, you guys need to hear this because you're hiring them. They have to be the ones that set the leadership yes, role. And I know, but I gotta finish it. Your time is up. And they have to protect have to our children. I know, I know my time's up I and I'm gonna to leave. You at five minutes. I know, I'm gonna leave. But I thank you for listening to me and I hope that there becomes processes and education for leaders that represent our children. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That concludes um, public comments for this evening. Um, our next agenda item, uh, agenda item 13, our board comments. Um, who would like to begin? I'll go. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I think this is obviously a time when words aren't sufficient. Um, we know that kids have suffered trauma. We heard from the mothers. Um, whatever the details of what happened, um, the emotional impact on kids, I, I believe, but I'm going to ask more questions about how we're supporting all the kids um, who were. Ask for the school. Well, Please. that's. So as a as a board member, we you know I can continue to follow up and ask questions, and I'm going to do that. And I will say that the phrase I've heard the phrase "boys will be boys" several times this evening. That is not a phrase that exists in my life. I don't believe that boys are incapable of controlling themselves. I think if we hold all people to high standards, then they live up to those high standards. So I will say that is a phrase that I will not tolerate um, anywhere in our school district, and I've shared that. And I don't know of anybody who is tolerating it, but I will just pledge to you that boys will be boys is not a phrase that I will tolerate as a reason for any kind of misbehavior. I expect more from boys. I expect more from girls. I expect more from people don't, who don't choose either one of those labels, from everyone. And so when we hear public comments, then what we do, or what I will do, is I can take those and continue to ask questions. And um, that's what I can promise to you tonight, is that I'm going to continue to ask questions. Um, I have asked many questions so far, and will continue to do so. But I will pledge to you that that excuse of boys will be boys, it just makes me furious. And I'm not saying, because I don't know the individual conversations that any of you have had, I'm not saying that I heard anyone say those words, but I'm hearing from you that you're hearing those words. So that's what I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Altman. Yes, ma'am. Um, John, was the investigation ever completed with Genoa Township? Uh, I couldn't answer that. You have to ask Genoa Township Police. Um, I, I have a couple of suggestions. Um, well, a couple of clarifications uh, that I need at least, and I don't know that you'll be able to answer these now. When there is an issue, I would like to know who in the building is investigating. Um, I'd like to understand that process a little bit more, um, and I want to know how families and um, children are notified of the outcomes. Um, I want to know why Genoa has not contacted us. Um, I'm not sure. I, I didn't say they haven't contacted us. We've been in contact with them. I can't come. I don't have an, an answer at this point today where they are in their investigation. I'd have to contact them. But we've been in constant contact with Genoa Township Police and Westfield Police. They've always been great partners in sharing with us what's going on, um, but I haven't had an update today. Would it be true to say that when Westerville investigates, our, our mental health team does it in tandem? Whenever we have a situation where a child experiences something that could bring trauma, we always initiate our mental health team, including our school counselors and social workers. We make those offers to families. It's a consistent piece of what we do um, in order to provide students uh, safe being. And so, yes, in general, that is always a response from us. But, but it is not that way in Genoa, correct, with our partnership with Genoa, is what I've been told? We always offer. The police, police if you're asking if the police offer, I'm not aware of police procedures really get related to teach students' uh, social emotional well-being. We always offer that opportunity. I thought we weren't allowed to initiate contact with the family until the investigation was complete. In general, with and I want to say when that, we're talking about I, I want to say in general, and um, I'm going to say it that way. In general, d depending on the nature of the event and the potential for criminal charges, the police will ask us to uh, delay the beginning of our investigation until they've gotten their part complete. That's not always the case. Sometimes it's more in tandem. A lot depends on the circumstances, the nature of the activity. So in general, um, 
depending on the nature of the activity. We, we discussed that. But I will say through our SROs, through our relationship with both Genoa Township and Westerville Police, we have a great positive relationship. We work in concert with each other, um, trying to get to you the best answer in any situation. Um, it's, a, it's a great working relationship. I am um, deeply disturbed that Genoa has not finished this investigation. I would like to know why. Um, my understanding is that the police finished their investigation and it's on the prosecutor's desk for their consideration as to whether or okay. not to press charges. Okay. That's my understanding. If I'm, if I'm not accurate, if somebody knows something more accurate, I apologize. That's the last update I get, but I'll get an update for the board and let them know. Okay. And then could you um, somehow publicly let us know uh, how buildings, who in the building investigates, the process that's used, and then how we uh, contact families and victims going forward. I would like to understand that, and I think it's important for the public to understand that. Sure would, and I would point anybody, particularly in the instances uh, of, of uh, what was referred to tonight, there is board policy and administrative guidelines that speaks to exactly how that's supposed to lay out. So it is a written piece for mm -hmm. us about how to handle a complaint when it relates to discrimination. Um, any of the, the kinds of incidents we talked about or listened to and learned about this evening and I've been dealing with. And so we act according to the board policy and administrative guidelines that are in place today. I'll be happy to pull those and share those with the board. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, 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 uh, it's very painful. And uh, I have sons, and um, I want to say to Miss Altman that boys will be boys is not a part of my language either, and I am one. And it never has been. And whether my tenure on the board is short or long is inconsequential to how I believe we need to get to the bottom of these incidents. I'm not asking you to vote for or against me. I'm just telling you that as a person and as a man, boys will be boys is a ridiculous statement. And so is girls will be girls. What I believe, speaking just for myself, is after eight years of being in this seat, it is my intent to continue to care very deeply about the physical health and the emotional wounds. And I think Dr. Kellogg this is probably echoing Miss um, Davidson. It, it just might be helpful to say that when, sure, policies and, and administrative guidance, we need to make sure we're on target there and that that's protecting children. But it just might be helpful to say that when an incident comes to our attention in a school, here is the process, here is where the reporting goes. Because we heard, hold the, for example, hold the athletic department accountable, ADs, et cetera, right? And then 
one, I believe you said thanks to the athletic director for supporting my child. I'll just, I'll just say that it, it is a, it is an ache in a parent's life when their child falls and skins their knee and the ache and the desire to protect them from anything never leaves you. And so whether you, I, and I'm just speaking for me, Mrs. Davidson, Dr. Nestor Baker can say what they would like. As for Rick Villardo, I will continue to ask questions. I will continue to follow evidence. But in my estimation, what is just as important I will continue to look deeper because I believe children have souls. And I believe we were talking about something deeper even than the physical harm. And so I will try to ask those questions, make those choices, and try to support you as you support your children. That's who I am. The vote doesn't matter. That's who I am. The anguish that a parent feels when something happens to their child, whether at school, at a friend's house, at a mall, wherever, is in many ways indescribable. Because we do trust that when we send our children into the world, that they will be cared for in the way we hope and believe they should be. When that does not happen, or when we perceive that doesn't happen, whatever the case may be, it is a ripping apart of the fabric that binds us together. And unfortunately, it is the child who suffers the most. It is the child who suffers based on what he or she experiences in the environment, in the school we're talking about tonight. It is the child who suffers as he or she watches the damage that occurs around the situation, however righteous that may be. It is always the child who suffers. We know that sitting here, and we don't take any of it as an okay or as a this is normal. I don't think anyone in this room would say that. Having said that, I want you to know what you wouldn't know otherwise just that I know everyone at this table has asked repeated questions about the process in a couple of the cases that have been brought forward tonight. What's going on? Where are we in the investigation? Were the policies that the board has set adhered to? What is the next step? How are we working with coaches? What can we do differently? Now, I sit with these people week after week, and sometimes we don't agree on a lot of stuff. You don't see that much either, but sometimes we don't. 
But I do know that every single one of us agrees that whatever we can do in our roles to diminish any likelihood of damage to any child is what we would do. I also know that we do believe in a number of the investigative processes that must be followed even as we struggle against the time they sometimes take. When you're dealing with young people, dealing with children, it is imperative that all of them be protected as an investigation goes forward so that we make sure that we do the best we can do not to inflict additional harm. Some of the incidents that occur in a school require the engagement of law enforcement. This district is never shy about involving law enforcement in those issues. It has been said that this district sweeps things under the rug. Just because you don't see doesn't mean it isn't happening. You may not agree with that, but it is a responsibility to ensure that investigations are carried out in accordance with the best processes that we can develop and the best processes that the law enforcement teams that we work with can carry out. I do not have a clear solution to say to you tonight. I can tell you that the coaches are being worked with. Oh yes, I can tell you that investigations do go forward. I can tell you that no one here takes any of it for granted or diminishes the importance of any of it. I'm sorry, I can't make it right for your child, to those of you who talked about your specific children. I wish that I could. You had your opportunity to speak. Ma'am. Ma'am. This is why we open it up. Ma'am. My son's told I'm gonna to have to ask you to please pl please remain silent. No These are board comments. Board These are board comments, and you have to also understand that we are bound legally as to what we can and cannot say about any investigation, including yours. You can listen to the victim. We cannot discuss this Not publicly. Older. Board comments, you had yours, I have mine, we all have ours. And here's the thing. Hopefully you will all take from what you have heard the depth of concern that is felt. You may not agree with the actions that we take or how we must take them, but there are processes, there are approaches, there are investigations, there are officers, there is a mental health team, and we will continue to work to make it better. Thank you, Dr. Nestor Baker. Um, allow me to um, say that um, I know that many of the situations um, that have been shared here this evening are extremely uh, important and we know that these situations are extremely painful and hurtful, especially for the families and for the young people that are involved. I can guarantee you that um, the situations um, are not being taken lightly. There are processes that are in place 
and as a member of the board of the, of the education, um, the tools that I have, that we have to deal with these types of situations um, seem inadequate, especially to those um, who are involved, personally involved in these situations, but policy is what we have to work with. We also have to trust the staff and administrators that we have in place to deal with these situations. And so what, um, what I would like to ask um, Dr. Kellogg um, of you um, this evening, if you could review these cases, these situations that have been brought to us this evening, and if you could update us as members of the board where we are with each of these situations. Uh, we don't know, we don't know the details of each situation, um, so there's not a lot I can say to you and intelligently um, comment on each situation that has been shared this evening. And so what I pledge to you that I will do and continue to do as is uh, the same pledge the other members of the board has and that is to follow up with our administrators um, to ensure that appropriate um, board action, um, appropriate action has been taken um, and will be continued to be taken. And information that can be shared will be shared. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave it there for now. Moving on to agenda item 14, dates, times, and locations of next meetings. Um, the board will meet in regular session on Monday, September 27th, 2021 at 6 o'clock p.m. at the Early Learning Center, located at 936 East Wind Drive in Westerville. As a reminder, space will be limited to 50 people to comply with health and safety protocols based on CDC guidance. Masks will be required and social distancing observed. Agenda item 15 is adjournment. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Dr. Nestbaker? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mr. Velardo? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Motion carries and we are adjourned.